Where? Okay. All right, welcome to what is today? Today is December 13th, and we're at the Finance and Operations meeting. I call the meeting to order. Uh, while I'm getting ready here, maybe I'll ask Dean Kaveh, Dean Moss Kaveh, to step to the uh, podium and anybody else that's going to help him. Our first, and we have a huge agenda here. I guess before I get going, I should uh, welcome student representatives Karande and student representative Dice. Yes. Just like it looks? Okay. Thanks for being here today, and, and I'd like to have you guys give introductions about yourself, but we're running a little late, so we're going we're gonna to save you the uh, embarrassment of having to speak in front of all these people. Thank you. So at this point in time, as soon as our presenters are ready, I am ready for them. Okay. Sir? <clears throat> that gets a little bit of water. I'll do yeah. that. Running. I can do that. It dry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, President Kaler. Thank you for the opportunity to present together with uh, Associate Vice President Julie Tonneson the request for a surcharge to the tuition for Bachelor of Science programs in the College of Science and Engineering and the Bachelor of Arts majors in the College of Liberal Arts associated with the CSC Science and Math programs. As will be presented shortly, the surcharge, as proposed, will be the same as the existing one for undergraduates in the Carlson School of Management and in alignment with differential tuitions for engineering and most computer science programs at all other Big Ten universities. The requested surcharge is necessary for the engineering, physical, and computer sciences and mathematics programs to strengthen and expand in response to Minnesota's and the nation's scientific and engineering workforce needs and the very strong student demand to enroll in our programs. So with your permission, I will now begin with some background and context to frame the request. You're welcome to do that, sir. Thank you. Well, it's good to get a glimpse at the historic, historical growth in the undergraduate applications in the College of Science and Engineering. And this is a really interesting uh, chart to, to examine. Uh, we've had about uh, nearly a five-fold increase in the number of applicants since 2002, and significant increase, obviously, in the number of admits and matriculates, as indicated at the bottom of the chart, about 40% increase in the uh, matriculates. <coughs> Along with the numbers, though, is quality of the students who have been coming to the College of Science and Engineering. While ACT is just one metric, it's one metric that, that is easy to point to. And as you can see, there has been an incredible increase in the uh, average uh, ACT scores for the students who joined the College of Science and Engineering, now at nearly 32. <clears throat> well, there are many other um, components that are good to point to because the College of Science and Engineering students are succeeding. They're succeeding because of the support from the college, because of obviously the uh, quality of the students that are coming to our programs. So as you can see, the freshman retention is now standing at about 96%, all-time high, and the four-year graduation has seen an incredible increase just over the past four years or so, standing at about 72%. The outcome uh, for these students is extremely strong. About 95% of our students uh, quickly become employed or are in graduate school. <coughs> and the starting salaries on the average uh, are also not surprisingly uh, strong uh, at, uh, at least this past year. Uh, last year, they being around 64,000. One thing that I always like to point out to, and probably not a surprise to you, is that uh, CSE graduates, and likely University of Minnesota graduates, are drivers in the state's economy, in that uh, much in contrast to all of our peers in the Midwest, actually 75% of the College of Science and Engineering graduates stay in the state of Minnesota and, um, and help the uh, 
industry and commerce within the state. So that's critical to uh, point to as well. Um, also, probably not surprising for you to uh, know that future demand for, for these professions are extremely strong. Uh, you can see some projections by Bureau of Labor Statistics, by DEED, and so forth, and, and they are very strong. And uh, on a daily basis, practically, many of us hear from, from our industrial partners that, that we need to actually produce many more students. So we feel, along with everything else, that College of Science and Engineering must grow to respond to the workforce needs um, in Minnesota and in the nation. Well, along with all these changes in the student demand and uh, the size of the program and so forth, obviously um, things have changed in terms of the, um, the resources that come to the college and where they come from. And this is just a quick reminder of what has happened to the state support for the university and therefore the College of Science and Engineering, the big drop. And, uh, and how much has changed in terms of the tuition income for a College of Science and Engineering. In the earlier years, uh, the first few years that are indicated here in that, in that big change, the college did have a significant expansion of its students and its tuition income increased significantly. And this provided um, necessary resources initially for the college to be able to manage some of the expansion needs um, and a number of building projects also came online uh, during that time, and the college was able to use those resources to respond to its share of the uh, burden for, for, uh, for, for those infrastructure needs. But things have changed. Things have flattened out now, and in fact, uh, we, we've run out of much of that extra uh, cushion that we've had in terms of our resources to um, manage and respond to the uh, potential growth needs or strengthening or keeping the quality of the college as, as we have it. Here you can see the, um, again, in terms of the output, in summary, we've had a 42% increase in number of graduates since 2008 um, in, in the college. So it has been an increase, but, but not still sufficient. Uh, and on the side, I, since I mentioned BA degrees in the College of Liberal Arts, which uh, offers several BA degrees along the sciences and mathematics in, in the College of Science and Engineering, as you can see, significant, there has been significant increase, significant increase in demand and, um, and the outcome of those programs as well. <clears throat> So we have been planning and looking at the possibility of, if we can, with appropriate resources to expanding the um, undergraduate enrollment in the College of Science and Engineering. So part of our planning exercise has been to investigate the pool of students because certainly we'd like to keep the um, pool as strong as they are um, and uh, to the extent possible or, or close to what they are at the moment but uh, be able to re respond to the extra need and demand. And as you can see, our estimates in terms of, again, using ACT and class rank had a couple of metrics, uh, show that if we go back down the pool of ad applicants for another 25% increase, we're still doing extremely well in terms of those metrics. As you can see, roughly 31 for ACT and 92% uh, uh, in the class rank. So, the additional growth, if we can find the resources, will not substantially impact the quality of our students. But we have constraints. Uh, space in the college has been exhausted, or usable space. And um, laboratory-based uh, instruction, as we try to expand these or, or modify them and update them, is extremely costly. And, um, and we have issues retaining faculty, attracting and retaining outstanding faculty that we need to uh, continue this, this, um, the quality of the, you know, the college and expand and, and increase the, the performance as well. So the demand and workforce needs exist, but we do need the resources to respond. 
Again, as I mentioned early on, uh, all big, big 10 public universities have adopted differential tuition for engineering programs over many years. These, these are not new. A couple of them are newer, but, but some of them have had this for many years. And most have it in their computer science programs as well. So the proposal. Uh, the proposal is that uh, we would uh, expand the existing $1,000 per semester tuition surcharge in the Carlson School of Management currently to all incoming CSE undergraduates, including transfer students. This is, as indicated at the end, starting fall 2019. It would apply also to CLA BAs, uh, Bachelor of Arts degrees, in the semester after they're accepted to a major in one of the CSC science and math programs. And those programs are indicated in this slide. And uh, we, Pell and you promise eligible students would not pay the surcharge. Mm -hmm. And I've indicated when the effective date would be for this proposal. Um, our estimates for the, um, <clears throat> for the income from this additional um, uh, surcharge, once it's been phased in after about four years, is about $12 million per year. And we estimate about a quarter of that to go to the um, uh, Pell and You Promise students, um, netting about $9 million roughly. Um, and of course, we expect, along with the, the surcharge, also there will be additional tuition uh, from, from increasing the uh, student population in the uh, College of Science and Engineering, which would help as well. Um, the expenditures would be unrestricted, as, as in the case of tuition within uh, budgetary constraints. But the initial critical needs are very much facility driven. And this is, to a large extent, actually facilities such as Lind Hall, which will be ready for, for upgrade and redo after English moves to Pillsbury, for example, 2021. There are areas like that which are absolutely critical for programs like computer science, for industrial and systems engineering and the like. And of course, for the laboratory project uh, pro uh, needs for uh, chemistry in what may be in the capital request, we don't know. Obviously, we hope it will be. Um, to, to redo Fraser Hall for, for uh, <coughs> teaching laboratories for chemistry and many others. Obviously, um, as part of the, the, the resources will be uh, used in parallel for uh, maintenance and expansion of the teaching laboratories, the instructional laboratories, and of course for the needs related to the faculty and other instructional personnel and, and advising personnel. So um, we have, uh, in terms of the expansion possibilities, we have had many conversations with the provost's office, with admissions, and the current plan is to expand the um, uh, additional students, freshman students, in the college by about 100 uh, in each of the next three years. And of course, we will also we will always, it is our focus for these students, while we scale up, not to suffer. In fact, we want to do better in, in teaching and mentoring these students and supporting their aspirations. And um, that is One more? Yes. my last slide. <laughs> Correct. Um, Chair Anderson and members, um, my, uh, I have a very brief and uncomplicated role in this presentation today, and that is we wanted to conclude this summary with some information on how this surcharge would be incorporated into the budget uh, for FY20 specifically. So just to, just to be clear, the surcharge would be included in the tuition rate tables that you see as part of the budget in the undergraduate portion of those tuition rate tables right along with the Carlson School of Management surcharge. We would also include in the budget document a narrative description of the surcharge indicating that it would be first implemented in FY20. The estimated revenue for FY20, the increase from the surcharge would be in that two and a half to three million dollar range. 
all going to the College of Science and Engineering. So you would also see that reflected in the total tuition revenue for FY20, and specifically on the lines in the attachments that show by college, it would show up under the science and engineering line um, as part of their tuition revenue. CSE would build a spending plan associated with that revenue and build that into their entered budget for FY20 in the system. And in addition to that, we would and they would uh, dedicate that revenue to the program and facility enhancements and the scholarships that, that Moss spoke about. Just a moment ago, the funds would not be diverted to cover the general compensation increase, for example. It would go specifically to the outcomes they're looking for here um, for the surcharge. And with that, Mr. Chair, we are thank ready you. to address questions. Thank you, Vice President Tonneson. Uh, uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, well thought out program. Uh, it's what we like to see here growing one of our premier programs. Um, it looks to me like if you grow it by 20% you can still keep your 31 ACT and you have the top 8% of high school students coming so I commend you for, for running the program. It's one of our premier programs. Today we are doing this as review. We've got about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, you're welcome to speak and we'll get back to it before we ever take action. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dean and uh, Ms. Connison. My initial reaction is um, uh, that we, uh, I'm supportive of the concept of differential tuition for this college, but that we may not be going far enough as it relates to international students. As I look at the data around the surcharge, sort of a surcharge on a surcharge, if you will, for international students. Um, <coughs> Rutgers and Nebraska and Illinois are four or five thousand dollars more than the surcharge that are being proposed for in-state residents. And if you look at the co who's the, where's the most elasticity of the demand? International students uh, that are focused on science and engineering uh, are they willing to pay? And they, are they able to pay full retail for? and a premium, uh, then that's the, this goes into the conversation we'll have in a few minutes about NRNR, but, but uh, I'd like to see you come back, and I know what the appetite of the board, the feeling of the board is, around some modeling for that, that, that specific subset of international students, maybe non-resident students as well in the United States, but particularly in the <coughs> Anything you'd like to speak to that, Dean Kuei, or? Um, Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm aware there are several, while all the uh, Big Ten public universities do have uh, the, some version of the surcharge, whatever they call it, you are absolutely correct that several of them do have an international student uh, increment in addition. Uh, University of Illinois, Purdue, and I actually didn't know about Nebraska, but maybe they do. Um, it is, uh, it is something that we've talked about before. We didn't want to do everything at once, for one thing, because we don't know actually what, what the demands are going to be from the international side, because that, that's very fluid right now. Um, it's something to consider in the future, uh, potentially. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, these, the, the question about differentiating between colleges is an old, old question, and I, this university has gone back and forth between different groups and then, every, and then sort of saying, well, we want to make sure that tuition isn't affecting how people choose to, to uh, pursue a course of study. We'd rather that be a matter of their interests and, and uh, their, their aptitudes. Um, this is a little unique just because you've got all these peers that are doing something similar. Um, and, but it, it's not, it doesn't escape um, me anyway in this process to, to, to you know, this is a pretty substantial independent tuition increase for this one school that's outside of our normal cycle. Uh, so it, it will have uh, an impact, again, as you say, not on the current folks, but, but folks going forward. And, and the concern that I have um, about that element is that, you know, this is an irrational market because of the subsidy that's provided. Um, across the board. Every, every collegiate unit can raise their tuition through additional fees and surcharges substantially with, before they would uh, walk themselves out of the marketplace. They could still fill with, with, with good students. 
but, but part of our charge, with particularly with the investment from the state, is to try to make it affordable. Um, and so it's that constant tension as to, we almost become the artificial consumer to say, no, we're going to make sure we keep the, the price low as well as the quality high because, again, it's a subsidized market, so it changes everything. Um, it is, uh, you know, and Regent Beeson you know, already identified that some of the some states have differential rates between resident and non-resident. As proposed, this is regressive for resident students. You know, it's a much higher percentage of, of an increase for them than it is for, for non-residents as it is, and I, I think that we should be very clear that that is the case, um, that we're creating more of an equalization when we're already um, out of, out of uh, alignment with uh, these other public institutions that receive the kind of public assist, uh, support that, that the university does. But the, the one point that I do want to uh, uh, specifically speak to is, and I, I've, I've spoken to this before, is the 25%, the um, it, it talks about how you know, the, the numbers reduced to cover that. Well, it's never collected, so I don't know that, if you're not collecting it from, from Pell and Promise, Promise students, you don't really have to provide it back. You're only drawing three quarters as much. Um, but my, my um, sense is, and, and my preference is, unless we have additional data, which I'll mention here in a moment, would be that if, if we only need 75% of the amount that would be generated, then it should be 750. Um, or we should, or, or it would be 1,000 from, from all students. My, my concern is this. Um, Programs like Pell are based on expected cost of attendance. They're not based on you know the cost of attendance at various schools. Some of which aren't charging very you know as much to students who would qualify. So I mean, when when the, the Pell formula is created, it's on the expectation that Pell students are paying the same as everybody else. My concern um, with respect to this is that Pell students aren't necessarily even the cohort that suffers the most from increases. I think that there is sort of this, you know, every time we, every time we do a, a Promise Scholarship program that's funded by other students, every time that we do an abatement of this variety where there's an increase, it's, there's a group that's just above eligibility for Pell, just barely there, and, and maybe not even getting support from home, because we don't do a very good job of really knowing who can compel their parents or, or parents to provide them uh, funding and, and, and who can't. So when, so if this, this is another example where we would be having, rather than paying it forward through philanthropy or from state taxation, it's paying it sideways. These three students are gonna pay to improve the offerings for this student, and, and we don't really necessarily know whether this student has greater need than, than, you know, one of these other three very well might just be in a trap where they're tied to income but they don't actually receive the support. So from that standpoint, what I would, what I would, would like to know uh, what I would request uh, from the administration is um, some some data that really reflects where is the debt, where's the student debt issue, where are we where are we running into that problem, is it Pell students, um, or or is it that strata that's just above eligibility for that kind of support that ultimately will bear the brunt of, of, of you know certainly the, the students from great wealth and access to that those resources it's not going to be a problem, but for those students that are putting themselves through but are just up above that that eligibility this will have that impact. My preference would be, like these other schools, and maybe they do have some exemptions, but I don't see them in the chart, um, would be that it, it applies across the board, and if the amount we need is only three quarters of what would be raised um, by the thousand across everybody, then make it 750 for everybody. And, and I certainly would in the future su suggest that we look at some sort of recognition of the difference between resident, non-resident, and international. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to answer that, Associate Vice President Thompson? Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Rocha, I just want to make one clarification. As the proposal is before you today, right. uh, two things. The, actually, the surcharge <laughs> would be technically charged in the system, and it's a scholarship that is offered right now to offset that surcharge in the proposal for all Pell and You Promise students. Um, so that would go up to, as you know, the Pro You Promise program um, provides aid to families up to adjusted gross family income of, of 100, 120000 So it, it is a little bit beyond Pell, just to clarify that. Uh, but it also allows us an opportunity in the future because it is a scholarship um, charged and then providing a scholarship to adjust or modify that scholarship program in the future mm -hmm. if we would need to do that. It's, not, an, it's not a waiver. Uh, Briefly, Regent Rosha. Yeah, thank you, Mr. I, I, yeah, the way I read it, it, it that wasn't necessary. But I, it's not of great consequence anyway. Um, 
Yeah, I recognize that, and I, but I still would point out that even if someone comes from a, 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 is tethered to a family income above that level, yep. they don't necessarily have access to that. You know, right. whether they're estranged or whether their parents have other family health expenses, whatever the case might be, we don't really know that. So, so that it's that next court. But but if we could get an, have an understanding of where that next strata is, that would be certainly give me a lot a lot of comfort as we would look at at this proposal with that condition. Okay, thank you, thank you. student representative Dice. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and thank you, presenters. Um, I guess I just have a couple questions, and um, one thing that I just personally don't really understand is how um, adding a cost that all of the, our Big Ten competitors have will, A, increase enrollment, and B, will not make us more competitive um, in, in comparison to other um, schools in the Big Ten that are for um, science and engineering. So, for example, um, if we were to add, or if we didn't have this surcharge and I was looking at schools and I was going to look at all of the Big Ten schools and say, I'm going to pick one of these to go and get my my degree in science or engineering or whatever, and the University of Minnesota didn't have this extra surcharge and all the rest of them do, then I'm going to pick that University of Minnesota. Um, I think students are very aware coming into their colleges of, you know, the extra charges that they're being, that are being imposed upon them, and they're going to see this um, and come in and say, oh, well, what's what's that extra $1,000 this semester doing out of my bank account? <laughs> because, you know, they're going to be confused, and um, and I uh, I don't see how that, how not having a surcharge doesn't increase our, you know, competitiveness, and I mean, we give such a great education to students, and it's for such a great price. I, I can see that as a complete advantage, and I think that in increasing the cost and adding the surcharge would be a disadvantage um, to getting students to come to the university. Um, I know it would be a disadvantage for me if I were if I were a high school student looking at looking to come to the University of Minnesota. Um, and I and I mentioned it as I was going through all of that, but um, I just I don't see the link of increasing tuition to increasing enrollment. To me, that would be the opposite. If you increase enrollment, I would see it as a decrease in, or if you increase tuition, I'd see it as maybe a decrease in enrollment. Students wouldn't be as motivated because the, the price is higher. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe you could just clarify how that works for me. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I had. So. Student Representative Dice, my take, and I'm gonna let, let Dean here answer just a second, is by having the extra money available, they're able to build more space and more classrooms and more professors to increase enrollment. And and maybe, Dean, you want to yes. comment on that? Is that? No, I, absolutely. You, you raise a very good question in terms of the broad market basis. Um, but as I, that, that initial, the, the very first slide shows, we turn away many, many students, many deserving students just because of capacity right now. Mm -hmm. And many of these are outstanding Minnesota students, which we really shouldn't be doing this to. And so we're trying everything we can, and particularly in some of our programs, to, uh, to get the resources so we can admit some of the, uh, admittedly, at possibly greater cost, but many of these students uh, would, would continue to come to University of Minnesota on that basis. Okay. Um, the, the issue on the NRNR side, um, yes, students would uh, from maybe Illinois would compare Minnesota with Illinois, and both of us would then have similar case. Uh, both would have this additional um, surcharge. Illinois happened to be higher, as an example. So, so it is not like they would see us as having something extra that they don't in the other state, with, with our uh, peer institutions in particular. And just hey, thank you, Dean. Really okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, That's thank nice. you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I totally see that. Um, and I know that we're in the middle of a $4 billion campaign for the university, so I would and I don't, I don't know where all that money goes or anything, but I would hope that, you know, right now, especially is the time when donors are excited about giving to the university, and I, and I would hope that some of that money could also help the CSE, because I totally understand it's a, it's a great field to go into. Obviously, I'm a science student. Um, and just a really quick comment um, is I didn't go to school in Illinois, where I'm from, because it was too expensive for me to go to school there, so I came here. So uh, whatever that's worth to you, take it. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna we're gonna keep moving here, and much like Region Omari this morning, we have a lot to accomplish. I've got five more regions that want to talk, uh, so if we could keep the comments brief, Regent Johnson. Thank you, uh, thank you for the presentation. Just thinking about uh, you have fourteen thousand plus applicants, five thousand uh, admits, and 
with a 30.9 ACT average, my thought of the surcharge that many of these students, absent Pell and you promise, are such good students, many of them are going to get scholarships, right? I mean, it, it's almost going to be, in many cases, negligible. They won't, they'll have scholarships because they're good in academics. Is that a true statement or not? Some do. We'd like to give many more scholarships, actually. I, I don't know, Paul. Uh, uh, do you have data on this? Mr. Chairman, maybe just about I don't know if we have the time to go through the scholarship. Yeah. You know, just just a, how, how many uh, of all your students are on scholarship you know, for the next meeting, if you get that information? Sure, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And, and Regent Paul said I can't use the excuse that I'm onboarding anymore. <laughs> I try not to, but it's but it's but it's but but it's real real brief. I'm very supportive of the program and wanting to enhance that and the faculty taking care of that. But um, I'm very much against tuition increase in any, especially for resident students. I'm, I'm totally against it. And and so my, I have two questions. One, what other sources of revenue have you looked for? I, I don't care what your top line budget is. You want to raise that, that's good. What other sources of revenue have you looked at? And then as far as the f facility expansion and, and so on and so forth, why isn't that part of the capital budgets we talked about a little while ago? Uh, thank you. Those are excellent questions. We're, we're always looking for other sources of revenue. We've had requests through the biennial budget request, certainly the, the last time uh, uh, we, there was a request on part of the university for a computer science expansion uh, request, which was, not, um, which was not funded. We constantly try for philanthropy. That's a big part of, um, as was mentioned a little while ago, we've had a little bit of a help on the, uh, for example, on, on some aspects of our program. Just very recently, when we opened two floors of, uh, of completely redone floors of Shepherd Laboratories for our robotics program, which is part of the expansion, that was 90% funded with philanthropy. So it is something that we uh, continuously look for. It is just not, uh, has not been sufficient to, um, to, to be able to respond to all the needs that we have. I give you another example. I, I talked about uh, improving and maintaining our instructional laboratories, which we've been able to fund at about a half the level that is needed on an annual basis based on our budget. Well, this, this just a few months ago, I was very fortunate to uh, have, have a donor who actually covered the other half. But this is once in a while. It does happen. It's not a systematic way for us to keep doing that. But that was a tremendous boost, again, to our uh, programs. For the, um, the, the chemistry building, as you know, is a major capital request if it goes through uh, eventually. But many of these other ones, like I mentioned, Shepherd Laboratory, Lind Hall, and so forth, are, are just not going to be, um, as far as I know, the possibilities for, for bonding requests. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Uh, Regent Cohen. Thanks, <clears throat> Chair Anderson. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just uh, two quick questions. Uh, Quick question, and uh, I don't expect that you would have this information right now. Uh, the one, I'm interested to know how many of the students at the College of Science and Engineering are NRNR students, non-resident, non-reciprocity, compared to our Minnesota students. But I don't expect you to have that right now. Um, and and then the, the second thing is that um, I... Uh, I think that the program has been very successful at the Carlson School, having the surcharge, and so I would be in favor of it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Omari. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my goal is to make you run over, so I'm going to have about five. <laughs> yeah. um, so I won't ask any questions, I don't think. I just have some, some thoughts. Um, number one, the international surcharge with the current climate of international students, I would actually caution heavily right now, uh, maybe in a year or two, coming back and looking at that. I think, um, you know, just because there's an elasticity doesn't mean that we should raise the price, right? So even if there is room to charge, we should be doing it strategically, which I think we're doing in here. Um, 
I, I worry about a few things. One is um, from Pell and Promise, I appreciate that those those numbers won't change for those students. But with the shifting demographics, we're predicting that more students will be needing Pell and Promise. So our, we have to adjust for, you know, what is $3 million now, which could later become, you know, $5 million or what have you. So thinking about how that money is going to go is important. Um, from the capital side of it, I, I appreciate that we need the lab space and, and uh, uh, teaching facilities, so on and so forth. But I, I hate to, to maybe say something that some might not want to hear, but we don't know if STEM fields are going to be booming like they are in 10 years. And so if they're not, are we having the space that we're building right now that is flexible to be able to have uh, that used for other things is something that I think we need to be uh, paying attention to as well. And then my probably my biggest concern uh, is that uh, while the Carlson has worked, I agree, uh, it's very clear that there's some have and have nots around the institution and Carlson is one of the haves uh, from, you know, advising to printing papers and so on and so forth. And so uh, I, I, I worry about that as well. And then lastly, student representative Dice, uh, one billion of the four billion dollars of the campaign is going towards uh, scholarships, so which probably should be a little higher. But. So, uh, Thank no you. question. Dean, do you have anything you want to say no, about that? Or no, no? Okay. I... He hits on the right cylinders absolutely there, yeah? I, <laughs> okay, we'll move on to uh, Regent Powell, and I'll just say, Regent Powell, you haven't been here long enough. You're still onboarding. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'll take that. So, um, so just a quick clarification, uh, Vice President Tomlinson. It, the um, Tomlinson, the, um, the two and a half to three million revenue, that's the combination of the, of the surcharge coming through and then the student yeah. population increase. So is that everything? I, cause I, well, I guess if it's not, I, I just want to understand the full oh, revenue, so you know, impact of both initiatives, you know, over the next four or five years. I mean, my numbers, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, it's 12 or $13 million. So it's very, it's very yeah. significant. It's, it's just know, a in general, I mean, I, I don't, I don't like tuition increases. This is a case where I see it, this is as us as a little bit off the market and but at the same time we're going to increase access and it also it, it really enables us to significantly strengthen the quality of the program so it just to me these are always balanced I don't like tuition increases I think this one is I think this one does an awful lot for us but I would like to see the f combined impact of the of the two things which are both going to generate incremental revenue thank you. okay thank you and finally Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, presenters. Uh, full disclosure, <laughs> Dean Cave is one of my old professors. And uh, uh -oh. he's crazy to see him. Uh -oh. You know, I checked, I checked the system. It's amazing. The A he gave me still shows up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I really appreciate this uh, discussion. Uh, you know, I'm generally in favor of expansion of the College of Science and Engineering. Um, I would prefer that the tuition increase would be borne more by the NRNR students who are getting a terrific deal by coming to school here, you know, especially in programs where we're rated number one or two or three, like chemical engineering. You know, the students coming from all over the country trying to get into that program, and they're paying the same low rate that, uh, and they're about to get a, a, a new faculty member who will up the game there even more. Um, but I think. Uh, you know, I, I would love to see more um, NR and R contribution to that. Um, I am interested in seeing how uh, we can increase the size of the school by getting the chemistry building and you know all those bottlenecks taken care of. And you know, it really can't happen soon enough. Uh, so, all in all, I'm, I'm supportive of this, and um, it couldn't happen soon enough. And I think a lot of our competitors have jumped out ahead and increased. Uh, their enrollments in, you know, uh, region, regional Mari, I think, I think STEM is going to be growing for, you know, decades. Um, and I think the workforce contribution to the state is significant. I didn't even know about the 75% um, number, but uh, that just uh, kind of seals the deal for me in terms of uh, being able to produce um, more, you know, uh, science and engineering uh, alums for the state of Minnesota, I think is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just finish up this by saying, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting conundrum since, since I've been here and before we talk about affordability versus access. Here you're going to mess a little bit with the affordability 
try to create more access for the students in Minnesota. So it's an interesting topic. Uh, if you've got nothing to say more, we're fine and we'll move on. Thank you for your presentation. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And we will, I comments. assume that this comes before us for a action in February. That's what I'm Mr. guessing. Uh, or Res Mr. President Mr. Kaler? Chairman. I, I'll yield to, uh, thank you, Chair Anderson, Vice President Burnett. Vice President Burnett. So, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you and members of the board. The reason we brought this <clears throat> for review here in December and for your consideration for action in February is if this is going to apply to next year's freshman class, we need to know that before we package aid in March. And those are when the aid packages go to the freshmen. So that's why this one, much like the next discussion, it's about planning for the, the how this would affect packaging of financial aid. Okay, thank you. So I, I'd uh, ask you to get your questions answered between now and February. So thank you very much. And we're going to move on to uh, number two, our resolution related to uh, fiscal year 2020 Twin Cities undergraduate non-resident, non-reciprocity tuition rate. Just a reminder, this is an action item today. So what I'd like to do is let our presenters present, and then we'll probably get a motion on the table before we begin the discussion. So I see Ms. Ewell, I see Ms. Tonneson, Vice President Tonneson. You're on your own. <laughs> Are we ready? All right, anytime, ma'am. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I have just two brief slides uh, today to summarize the President's recommended recommendation for the FY20 non-resident, non-reciprocity undergraduate tuition rate on the Twin Cities campus. As discussed in October, the proposal is for a 10 percent get it on there for you, a 10% increase to that undergraduate rate, that would be $2,880, resulting in a tuition rate for the year of 31616 Continuing students paying the non-resident, non-reciprocity rate would see no more than a 5.5% increase, just as we have implemented in the past several years. This particular rate is not proposed to generate a certain amount of revenue. In other words, we did not calculate a desired revenue and back into the rate. Um, instead, it is pro a proposal at this level to better recognize the quality of the educational experience uh, that these students receive compared to our peers and compared to the resident rates rank uh, in those same comparison groups. We do anticipate that this particular rate would result in a movement in rank from about 12, to, well, from 12 uh, today in the Big Ten to about eight or nine um, in that Big Ten comparison. As displayed in October, we do estimate the net revenue gain from this proposal to be $6.8 million. That is based on a number of assumptions. It is first based on the assumption that we would meet our freshman enrollment target for domestic and international non-resident students next fall, which is up 110 from what, it, what we actually received this fall, but is still less than the actual realized um, recruitment the several years before that. Uh, a total, it also is based on a total non-resident, non-reciprocity enrollment decrease of 60. So when we look at and analyze the retention rates, the graduation rates, and so forth, and look at the cohorts going through the system, mm -hmm. the total non-resident, non-reciprocity population, we estimate, will be down by 60. It's also based on an assumption of an increase in the waiver allowance of a million dollars. You might remember in October we showed three different scenarios, each of which had a different assumption for the waiver budget, increasing as the rate increased. So this is the amount, a million dollars, associated with um, the 10 percent increase. That would be our recommendation. And finally, it's based on the assumption right now of stable recruitment costs. Each percentage increase in the rate above 5.5% actually generates about $340,000. So most of the revenue gain here, the $7.8 million before the waivers, uh, does come from the proposed 5.5% on continuing and new students. You can see from the chart that the gross revenue here across all the, the cohorts would be $158.5 million. We deduct 1.2 million, that's reflecting the drop of 60 students in the total enrollment. The discounting at 20.7 million is up $1 million. It's today 19.7, so it would become 20.7. And then the recruitment costs are the same um, as they are this year. 
any recommended strategies to improve recruitment uh, through investing in new activities or, or new personnel would be included in the budget we bring before you in June as part of the investment budget. And you can think about that as when we, if we bring that forward, it would be spending some of that $6.8 million uh, to achieve uh, enrollment targets. And with that, Mr. Chair, that summarizes the proposal uh, before you today and as reflected in this resolution. Thank you, Associate Vice President Tonneson. So if you look in your packets on page 25, 26, there is a resolution with an attachment. Uh, it basically says that it's a 10% um, rate increase for NRNR with a 5.5 maximum threshold for returning students. So is that is there a motion to uh, for that resolution? So is there a second? Second. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. So we do have a motion on the table. Now we can open it for discussion. Uh, student Representative Karandi. Yes. Thank you, Chair and Senate members of the board. If the tuition increased, I will have to take a fifth job. I currently work three on-campus jobs and one off-campus. Or I would drop my on-campus job and pick up one or two more off-campus jobs. This was said by a second year finance major from New York in the Carlson School of Management. Then, when speaking from students from the University of Houston and Miami, the one thing they all agreed upon regarding why they did not attend this university was cost. We collected over 600 similar stories in merely six days. Some of these letters you all had a chance to read this week when they were shared with you from the board office. With just one look at this document, it should be clear that undergraduate students are more concerned about their situation than they ever have been. The mission of a land-grant university is to serve the students of the state, whether it is the corners of Brooklyn Park or the bluffs of Red Wing. The land-grant serves the students. The initiatives set place have been doing so strongly, from the U Promise Scholarship to Explore the U Day. But how do we look at recruitment in terms of diversity of thought geography and identity. Our university is a talent magnet from our top 20 undergraduate business program to our cutting edge science and engineering programs. We are home to some of the brightest students in the country. This talent should be and is meant to be diversified. That is how we are challenged. That is how we make change and that is how we grow. Students like these from diverse locations are the backbone of some of the most innovative and creative inventions from this university. As stated in today's committee's docket, the recommendation for a 10% increase is not based on specific calculations of how much additional revenue is needed to balance the budget. What are we then saying the increased tuition is based on? What then is the basis? A matter of value? A being within the middle of the Big Ten? Prices don't change perceptions. People do. This is what made me and my peers come to this university. That people, the people we serve today are students. That's why we must listen to them when it comes to this decision. And included in this decision are parents. What are we saying to the many parents that would like our children to receive a world-class education without having to overburden themselves financially? What are we saying to the parents that experience a poverty cycle that cannot bear the financial burden upon their children by tuition? Why are we shutting the door on them? A student from Georgia studying psychology and neuroscience said, I would feel guilty, guilty that I'm putting financial pressure on my parents to stay at a place I love, guilty that my sisters may never get to experience what life is like outside of Georgia, guilty that I attend this university selfishly and without regard for the condition in which my family has to live. Even looking to our students that are coming from around the globe, an international student studying economics said, even with a 5% increase, I would simply have to transfer. We fail our mission when we increase tuition to levels that make the cost of living unbearable. We create a disparate impact by raising tuition to these heights and at a rate that is imaginable. Our students from diverse backgrounds, various socioeconomic positions, and many geographical locations are suffering. Our inclusive success for students of color is below 50% in the Twin Cities, and we're raising tuition for a portion of these students. Additionally, some of these students do not have the opportunity to attain scholarship funds, and there's not enough knowledge on the discounted options in time for the decision to come here. The job of the university is to operate as a land grant. We do not argue with that. 
But first and foremost, our job is to educate the best and the brightest, regardless of background, and we are quickly losing those students due to tuition increases. If the students of Minnesota cannot compete with the best and the brightest of our states, are we failing to give them the education we promised? Are we truly creating citizens that will go on to lead, be innovative, and be the dynamic future of the state of Minnesota? It has been mentioned that other Big Ten institutions have higher NR and our tuition rates with comparable to ours, but we ask who is applying and who do we want here? As stated here today, we hope to increase the diversity of recruitment of our out-of-state students. We must follow up with that promise and what we do as a university. So I make two arguments here. First, the rate at which tuition is increasing for NRNR students is not sustainable. It creates a problem with our students' ability to succeed at this university in many facets, which does not align with the mission of this university. Secondly, for lack of a better phrase, we're putting a bad taste in the mouths of our students and their parents with increases of tuition year after year. When a College of Science and Engineering student from Kansas reflected on her parents' reaction to the possibility of her tuition being raised yet again, all she had to say was, they trusted the University of Minnesota. Another student stated that increasing out-of-state tuition would effectively diminish the Board of Regents' goals illustrated in their mission statement. And they quote, to the sharing of this knowledge to the education for a diverse community and to the application of this knowledge to benefit the people of the state, the nation, and the world. As we practice the advancement of learning in search of truth, we owe it to this generation and the next to bring in students from diverse locations, from various backgrounds, and varying identities. That is how you serve the students of Minnesota, by bringing in the best and the brightest, by giving them chances to interact, to learn, and to create, and to create with the best students from around the country and the globe. That is how you serve the mission of a land grant. Thank you. Thank you, student uh, representative Crandy. Thank you. Uh, Regent Cohen. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair Anderson. Well, I couldn't be more thrilled than to hear your statement, so I appreciate it very, very much. And um, you said it so much better than I possibly could, but the importance of diversity of perspectives. And that's one of the things that I think makes our university a world-class university and not a, <clears throat> and how important it is for us to be sure that we have those kinds of diversity of perspectives. Uh, this morning, even, uh, when Provost Hansen was talking about enrollment planning, the third point that she mentioned, and I wrote it down, was uh, to attract out-of-state students. That's one of the uh, areas that's important to us. Uh, I know that last year's applications for NR and our students were down because we increased by a large amount, 15%. I believe that 10% is too big an increase this year. I would prefer something considerably smaller, but I think 7.5% at least would be an indication that we're not going to make gigantic jumps uh, and that we value the perspectives of our students from all over the country and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Cohen. Uh, Regent Powell. Um, thank you, Chair Anderson. So just, uh, again, a clarifying question. Um, did, did I hear you say that the six, seven million um, in, in additional revenue really is coming from the five and a half percent um, increases that are coming on, uh, you know, the, the succeeding students and not on the, not on the, the year one um, uh, tuition increase? Vice President Thompson. I don't know if that was clear or not, but I think yeah. you got it. Yeah. I understand. Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Paul, the way that the tuition revenue estimates work, of the $7.8 million yeah. increase, all but 1.5 of that would be coming from a 5.5% increase on all students, including the new students. So new freshmen, if you were to implement a 5.5% increase, then the revenue estimate would be 6.3 as an example. Okay. But jumping from five and a half to 10 adds 1.5 million to that. Okay. So, I mean, what I'm taking from that is that we're on the, on the 
ten percent increase. I mean, we're one step forward and one step back, and it's the, it's the other components that are really driving the revenue increase. Senior or Vice President Tonneson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Paul, it's because of the numbers of students paying those different rates. I guess, I mean, my comment is I'm just, um, I support it. I've supported this increase for all the reasons that we've discussed as a board, that we were, you know, well underneath and I wanted to see us move to a midpoint. I mean, I am worried that we're, appears that we're, you know, we're losing, we're losing students now and that, that this could eventually become a revenue problem for us. And I think we just need to recognize that. We'll have a hole here that somehow that, that we have to fill. And so, so, um, I'm in, I, I'm very interested in how we're spending the additional <clears throat> recruiting money because I think one of the ideas was that we would invest and that we felt if we went harder we could you know we could bring more students in through recruiting. I'm very interested in separately having a discussion on how that's going and what we can do to strengthen that. And I do worry that um, we could um, you know create um, a problem here that we didn't fully anticipate a revenue problem. I, I thank you, Regent Paul. I think just to clarify the math problem, I think, I think, uh, you know, I think of things in kind of strange ways, but the 6.3 million in addition comes from the current students who would pay 5.5, and the additional 1.5 million we would get would be the incoming freshmen who play it. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. The the five the the 6.3 would we would come from a 5.5 percent increase on Correct. all students. That includes all NR. the income. All yes. NR. NRNR students. Yes. Okay. All in all NRNR students, current and new next fall. Okay. So we've got Regent Rosha. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've kind of uh, sort of separated into a couple different concepts. One is the equities, and then the other is the economics. Um, and I, I won't walk through some of the arguments that I know um, I've made in the past about the responsibility of the institution. I will say this that. You know, as, as we were um, listening to what I thought were very um, compelling and, and thoughtful remarks um, about, with respect to uh, our obligation um, to students from outside of the state. I, uh, you know, New York was brought up. We've got Illinois. A number of different states have been have been identified. And I was looking at in, in New York, the, the, the out-of-state tuition that a Minnesota student would pay is, is nearly four times what a resident student would pay, and, and, and to the extent that we have hundreds and hundreds of Minnesota students who are not admitted to the land-grant university, um, the, the, one of the challenges we face is that there's no other institution in the nation. There's not a school in Kansas or Illinois or New York or, or Florida that has an obligation to provide that opportunity for Minnesota students, and if they are in, in, in able to make it to those schools, they will they will pay a non-resident rate that's substantially higher. So it, it, there is a, it, it, it's a tough balance um, to uh, address that concern. We, we certainly understand the market-driven component of this. Uh, with respect to Regent Powell's remarks, I think that's, I think that's a very important thing to analyze. I, I do note that with our, in our, in our numbers, it's not as though we admitted everyone who applied. We chose who to admit. We had other students we could have admitted, which would have obviously left us um, in a better financial position. So you know, you, you kind of have to get into why we didn't admit sort of that next group of students that would have kept us at the same number as the previous year and then understand that whatever it was that you were gaining, you were paying for, right? We paid for, whether it's maintaining ACT scores or otherwise. So so we, we still have, I, there, I have, I've yet to see any data that would reflect that going the, the market um, route um, is going to uh, cause us to have challenges. In fact, when we look at um, even even Wisconsin to our east is, has uh, already made a determination to to raise um, their N R N R tuition, um, and they they continue to see growth. Um, even the University of South Carolina, uh, it was just recently in an article about how their N R N R applications, and they charge four thousand dollars a year more for N R N R than Minnesota does, and they they've seen their numbers continue to to increase in applications and quality. So, I feel comfortable um, that. Um, we are moving in the right direction. I, as, as I've stated in the past, I would have simply made the move back to the midpoint with respect to incoming students so that there's a signal and that they understand what they're, what they're getting. To that, to that end, um, I don't love the 5.5 on existing. Um, I, have never saw it, I have never saw this approach as being one of revenue generation, um, although it does have that positive effect. And when you look at, at, you know, when you look at a Wisconsin, which has a 30% lower resident tuition rate, but then a 
you know, more than 30 percent non-resident um, uh, gap above uh, what we charge, you can see where there are some opportunities there to, to provide uh, access for the, the students uh, whose um, families rely on the land-grant school and, and fund it. Uh, but with respect to students who came here with certain expectations, I certainly could be persuaded that, that uh, you know, being two and three times the rate of inflation is, is an unnecessary surprise for those students, and that's nothing that I've ever advocated in the past. But as it relates to the 10 percent to move us up into a cohort that accurately reflects the quality of our institution uh, in that market number and then also provides us some resources to attract the best and brightest through scholarships and abatement, I think that that is definitely the right thing. I'd go higher than 10 percent, but I can... Uh, I can survive um, and accept the fact that 10% is moving us in the right direction, even though, to a large extent, we're not catching our peers because they continue to have increases that uh, make it hard to catch them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and um, uh, I, I think the board's within a fairly tight range of where the inc they, where, uh, they see the increases from 75 to 10%. This is an art, not a science. So. Regent Cohen might be correct, seven and a half is the right number, but uh, I, I prefer pushing a little harder to the 10%. If you step back when we first adopted the strategy three years ago, there were a lot of concerns about the fact that this would not work. And three years later, at the end of the day, even after the costs that we've incurred related to recruiting and wavering, we have brought more money into the table of this institution. And a lot, and that money dollar per dollar has reduced the resident tuition, and that's reduced it by one or two percent ongoing. So that's not an unimportant number. So I, it's our responsibility to push the envelope. To me, this is a fairly uh, clear issue, financial issue about about supply, uh, about supply and demand. And I'll tell you where I'm really concerned about uh, where I where I. I'm going to put it on the table. I've talked to Vice Provost McMaster about is if Wisconsin Madison keeps reducing the number of Minnesota kids who are admitted to that school and lower than the number that we admit from Wisconsin, we're going to end up with a cap here for Wisconsin students because we can get a lot more money from NRNR students. We could reduce the, we could reduce the price for NRNR students for all of them if we had a larger cohort of them. So that's a, that's a conversation we better have next year, or I, I'm going to introduce a resolution if we start seeing that trend go backwards, it's on the record. So I will support the 10%. Let's be driven by the data going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, next speaker is Regent Johnson. Thank you. Uh, historical question. Was there ever a time at the University of Minnesota when resident tuition and non-resident were the same? Uh, uh, Senator Johnson, I feel like you'd be the best one to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be curious. Uh, I'm just sitting here listening, and I'm like thinking, I wonder if it was ever the same at some point in time. You could, uh, you and I will look it up, Ms. Tonneson. Right, thank I think you. you need to walk over to the archives and take a take a look. Take my suggestion. Uh, that's your comment, Regent Johnson. Thank you, Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, uh, in in an attempt to answer Regent Johnson's question, um, if there was, it was a really, really long time. <laughs> and um, as you know, the, the uh, mission of the university was to originally serve the state of Minnesota. And uh, there was no concept of um, allowing <coughs> non-residents to zero go to school tuition. here at one time. What's that? At zero tuition, Mr. Chairman. And that was the intent, at zero <laughs> tuition. Um, and, and I would just say that when I came to school here in 1983, by the time I accepted my um, offer and showed up here, tuition out of state, I came from out of state, tuition went up 25%. So that was, that's the single largest increase that, um, that I think has occurred since 1960, which is how far back our official data goes online anyway. Um, I would just say that uh, um, I, I look at this, I look at our undergraduate uh, um, resident students and to me they they just appear to be subsidizing the non-residents and the reason I see it that way is because you know when we when we decided to reduce the um, NR and our tuition to resident plus 4,000 back in what was it 09 or 09 
um, that changed everything. And that's why we're having a hard time getting back up there, because everyone's complaining about the fact that we're increasing tuition. Um, but I think the, the great news is everyone since 2009 that's been here has just been getting a spectacular deal. And if you look at the differential, I mean, the, uh, the multiplier, so you look at some of the most expensive in our, in our schools in the Big Ten, and they're charging four times their resident tuition. Okay, so their residents are enjoying, um, you know, what they, what they arguably deserve because they're the ones paying the taxes in the state that they live in. And I would say that in, in Minnesota, we're just barely getting to a 2x multiple, I think, with this, with this next increase. And that's why I really do support because I, uh, an increase higher than that because uh, the quality of, the, of education we provide is, is, I think, equal to or greater than a lot of our peers. And by not charging that um, the same amount as they are, we just look like we're not as good a school, which I've been arguing for four years. And I've used various examples that people don't like, like Toyotas versus Lexuses and that kind of thing. But it, really all I'm trying to say is that, you know, we should be charging a lot more than we are. And um, AVP Tonnison, uh, in the last, in the previous discussion, explained how these waivers look like scholarships to the students um, that would get them. And I think that's really where we need to get to, where we have a high sticker and then we give them what appear to be scholarships on their bills, because that's really what people are looking for. They're looking for high quality institution and they're looking at for a great deal. And I, I just assume that our, our net price calculators are going to be reprogrammed and it's going to reflect that, uh, you know, for certain people that they're going to be getting a, a great scholarship uh, courtesy of the University of Minnesota. So I think 10% totally reasonable, uh, seeing as though, you know, it barely gets us, um, it gets us to a three in front of our uh, NR and our number. Um, you know, Michigan's at, Michigan's got a five in front of their number. And if you look at the difference between what we're leaving on the table and what Michigan, if they're collecting it all, and they, they might be, um, that it's a significant amount of money. And we're, we continually talk about not having enough money to do things um, at our school in terms of quality, increasing quality, increasing programming, all that kind of thing, or increasing scholarships. You know, those are, those are all things that are possible when you, when you charge more money for your non-resident students. So long story short, hey, you know, this is something we got to do. It's unfortunate. Um, I do want non-resident tuition to go down as well, but I don't think I'm going to get that anytime soon. Um, so this 10% uh, increase, I think, is is reasonable, especially since most of the money is coming off of the 5.5. Thank you. And thank you, Regent Hsu. Uh, Regent Sviggum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I probably can enhance upon uh, Regent Hsu's good comments, very, very thoughtful comments, but I'll try just a little bit. Um, I'm sure as President Kaler and his staff have brought forward this uh, suggestion to us of NR, NR increase, uh, first of all, we are all aware that choices in life have consequences, right? We understand that. And I know that President Kaler and his staff have thought about the diversity of other students from other states. I know they have thought about competitive charges of, <clears throat> of other uh, higher education institutions. I know they've thought about costs. And they've come with this balance. And President Giller, I think it's the right balance as you look forward to building your budget in the next year. The choices have consequences. It is so important to be aware of that. Here's the pie we're dealing with, folks. This is our pie. Let's call it a $4 billion pie. You're going to be in or without $100 million of that, right? $4 billion pie. It's, it's this simple. We're going to... Uh, either increase the rate a little bit or students out of the state, NRNR, NR, or the consequence would be to increase costs for Minnesota kids. That's a choice. And that's a consequence for Minnesota kids. Another choice is to go to the legislature and ask for more money than the 87 million, which I think we're reasonably at this point looking at asking. And good luck to any of you they're going to go to the Minnesota legislature and say we want to increase taxes on Minnesotan taxpayers 
so we can reduce their tuition rate on students outside of Minnesota. Good luck to you. You're not going to get a vote. The third choice is we can become more efficient and reduce our spending here in the $4 billion budget. We haven't been very good about doing that, if that be a choice. Uh, we've reallocated some monies, but I don't know that we've reallocated them to reducing tuition. So we're not going to save the money. So the pie is gone, folks. That's the three choices and the consequences of the three choices. I think President Gaylor has brought forward a balanced one to us. I strongly support it. These three choices are gone. Thank you, Regent Swigum. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair. Um, last year when we decided to go with the 15%, I was afraid we were going to get ahead of our skis. And by some measure, we did get ahead of our skis. We didn't get as many um, NRNR students. And that costs us money. And it depends how far ahead of your skis you get before you start sliding down the slope. Um, I agree with Regent Rocha that I'm, I'm nervous about the 5.5, too. I think that's really hard on people that came here with a certain expectation, but I'm not suggesting that we roll that back, but it makes me uh, queasy. Uh, but I think the, um, we have an ecosystem of higher education here in the state. It's the privates, it's the MinSQ, it's the two-year and the four-year MinSQ. It's our coordinate campuses, and it's the University of Minnesota. And we are really the only ones that can attract students from out of state in large numbers. And we have a workforce shortage here that's for real. Every day in the paper they talk about they don't, today it was they don't have enough police and then there's not enough teachers and all of our uh, employers are worried about the, the workforce. So I don't know, I think, I think we have to continue to be that beacon for talented out-of-state people to come here and want to come here, and I think we are the ones that can do that. And I don't want to get out ahead of our skis, and I'm afraid that 10% uh, is a little high for right now. Thank you, Regent Lucas. Uh, student Representative Dice. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, so first of all, I would just like to say a huge thank you to my friend and colleague, Representative Karandi, because out of all of you that have spoken today, um, Regent Cohen was the only one that really thanked her and kind of appreciated what she said. And I think that what she said and the work that she did collecting the, the stories of over 600 students is immeasurable to, to this discussion. And I just, I think that everything that she did with that was just outstanding work. So with that, um, from what I heard, I think you should have received some of those stories, and I, I hope you looked at them, and I hope you really took them into consideration. Um, because as, as an NRNR student myself, um, I feel the impact that this will have among the student body. And although I won't be here next year after I graduate, um, I, I understand that they are looking to this decision with anxiousness. <laughs> so, um, you know, some of the things that, that um, Representative Karandi really, really found with her research in this was that students, and I quote, said, I will never support the university post-graduation should, should, this, should this rise um, in tuition go through. Um, you know, they, you know, some of these things that they, they said and that um, they really noticed, they, fa students and fam families will experience the financial burden of increasing tuition, and that'll probably be for years and years and years to come of just one family. Um, it's expensive to go to college these days. <laughs> um, you know, and, and like, like, she mentioned um, students would feel guilty just continuing to go to this institution with um, what their parents pay for them. My sister went to a very expensive private school for a year, and my mom and I lived off of ramen noodles and fried egg sandwiches for months <laughs> because of how expensive it was. And that's the impact that this decision is going to have. That's the impact that this would have on a student like myself, like my sister, like Gile. Anybody in this room that's a student could say that. Um, so I just, I, I really hope that you take into, into consideration those particular students, the 600 students <laughs> that Gile got, got stories from and that, that got, you know, opinions from. And another thing she said is in this report or um, little summary of, of all of the stories that she collected 
was um, increasing tuition will hinder the university's progress towards achieving a more diverse and inclusive campus. And I 100% stand behind that. Um, and I would just hope that in your decision today that you really take into those they take those students into account because ultimately the impact that you have with this decision will be on those students. And with a rise in tuition, I, I don't think it would be a positive impact. So thank you. Thank you, Student Representative Dice. Finally, I've got uh, Regent McMillan that would like to speak before we take a vote. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And uh, I do appreciate, and I know my colleagues do too, the work and uh, exceptionally hard work that our student representatives particularly on this issue, and, and uh, this isn't easy, and thank you for bringing those perspectives to us. So we embarked on this some half a decade ago, and, you know, if we, embark if we put a 10% increase in place today, we'll have been closing in on 40% over the last uh, three years, and I don't have the seven and a halfs that preceded that, but, you know, there was quite a few of them, and as I look back on that, and I'm not one to second guess anything, but I think a sizable jump to the middle would have probably been a better perspective. It, it's too late now. Um, I, I'm personally interested in reinserting this process into the broader budget process going forward. I know not all of you share that interest, but I think it kind of creates a license for us to uh, to uh, continue to push this this issue and and it takes a lever off a budget and revenue and outcome lever off the table in May and June when I'd like to see it there it forces us into other things when we decide now but that being what it is that effort to increase this was driven by you know our our assessment of our market pricing power reflective of our assessment of our demand and the quality of the product service we offer and I think after all those increases we're starting to test the outer edges of you know the elasticity portion of this demand curve and we need to take heed of that and I think we have made significant movement to bring a 2x difference in our in-state and out-state um, tuition rates and whether it should be 3x or 4x I don't know but I want a whole lot more data about our market pricing power and what uh, you know what what dangers we face doing that so I can support one more increase but next year I'm, I'm not going to be there and I worry what a series of 10 and 12 and 15 percent increases is doing to that marketplace so um, that's just my view I want to most strongly endorse if we're going to pull some element of our in-state out of state in our in our reciprocity piece of our revenue puzzle out for deep dives. I'm with Regent Beeson that reciprocity is the next one that's got to get pulled out and looked hard at. I think only Regents Johnson and Swigum can help us understand how we ever got to the reciprocity outcomes we have because I know there's gubernatorial issues and legislative issues, but that doesn't feel fair anymore. And uh, and I would like to see us take a deeper dive on that wing and put the rest of this back in the budget conversation. With that said, I can support an increase today, but I am do so with trepidation. Thank you, Regent McMillan. Uh, with that, everybody has spoke. I think I can actually count votes from what people have said, but we're gonna go on and vote anyway. Uh, so the motion on the table is a 10%, um, 5.5% .5 continuing. And there's an attachment that uh, it does, just if you haven't seen it, does have the surcharge to continue at uh, Carlson. So all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Opposed. Motion carries. So we'll go to the next uh, item on the agenda. Thanks, I should say thanks for all your input from everybody there. The next item on the table is, uh, while they're setting it up, it's the uh, traffic regulation and ordinance. And I just want to point out it says review and review in action. I want you to know that this ordinance is for review, but we have to have action for a public hearing because it's a traffic ordinance. So uh, we'll have maybe um, Vice President Bertelson and Director Allenson can maybe go through this fairly rapidly and we can catch yep. up. I, uh, you know, it's important enough to let everybody speak on the last motion and not interrupt anybody, but maybe you can help us catch up with some time if you would. Are you are you ready there, uh, Vice President Burleson? We are ready, Mr. Chair, members. Thank you. We will work to quick, 
quickly move ahead. We are act, having you act as the city council now. You get to sort of change your role. Think of yourselves as the uh, traffic regulation folks. This is a policy we haven't updated for quite some time, and it's going to let Director Allenson from Parking Transportation Services walk through it. Chair Anderson and members, thank you for this opportunity today to present, and I'm going to just start with a, a brief introductory summary. Minnesota statute in section 169.965 provides the authority to the regions to regulate traffic and parking on our property. This section also describes the process for us to adopt those regulations. And as part of that process, a public hearing on the proposed amendments and changes is required and the notice of the public hearing will be required to be published in a legal newspaper in each county that will be affected by the ordinance. So we are to here before you today for two uh, purposes. One, to review the proposed amendments, and secondly, to request the board take action to establish a public hearing date. The ordinances were last amended in 2011. And since that time, a number of issues have been raised that bring us before you to recommend updating various components of these ordinances and to adding a new ordinance section. So key additions include providing for restricted vehicle roadways. This change will allow UMPD to enforce vehicles being on roadways traveling um, when they are not appropriately permitted. We've also added a new section that will add language that will allow us to address the emerging modes of transportation. These would include recently um, in the news items such as motorized foot scooters, and dockless bike uh, sharing, but would also include other items that have come up over time, such as segways and hoverboards. <laughs> as we reviewed the ordinances, other items were identified and uh, decided that we should bring those forward to update those items, such as defining and regulating stopping and standing, clarifying appropriate use of the transit way on the Twin Cities campus, elimination of the moped permit requirement, and allowing skateboard and longboard use on campus. Number of other items were changed just to clarify language, ensure accuracy, readability, and provide completeness. And with that quick summary, I would be happy to address any questions that you may have. Okay, so what I'm, I'm gonna do first before we ask questions, I'm going to uh, ask if there's a motion to recommend approval of the resolution. resolution. So moved. Second. Okay. And this, this is uh, just for the public hearing. I want you to understand that, that we're establishing a public hearing. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, we'll have any discussion, any discussion on the traffic ordinance. Okay, my knowledge of this, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we will set a public hearing prior to our February meeting, listen to the public hearing, the input, and then proceed with the meeting and go ahead and vote on the ordinance at that time. Is that Correct. Okay, terrific. So you all understand that? We'll have a public hearing. So at this time, if there's no discussion, all those in favor of setting the public hearing signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. You guys did a wonderful job of getting us back on schedule. <laughs> but so it actually calls for a uh, recess here. I see we just figured you're nodding your head. You need a recess? I'll move it. <laughs> let's, let's take a quick like seven seven minute recess let's try to get back on schedule okay we don't need because we're all welcome to to leave when we want to and we'll still have a quorum so let's take about seven minutes here and we'll be ready to go
here as soon as we can get the uh, the rest of the group in here. Um, looks like we're going to have uh, Vice President Bertelson and Director Lindell King of the East Cliff uh, Committee next on with a capital budget amendment. So if you want to sit down and I guess we have a quorum, so we are ready. Yeah. And then we'll uh, I guess Senior Vice President Burnett is going to tee it up here while you're getting ready. Go ahead, Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And members of the committee, we have um, for your review today uh, the proposal for a capital budget amendment with respect to East Cliff and capital improvements that have been recommended by <clears throat> the East Cliff Technical Advisory Committee um, with respect to infrastructure needs and safety needs at East Cliff. And, at that time, and I'd like to turn it over to Vice President Bertelson and the chair of ETAC, who's joined us today, thank you for being here, um, to walk us through the recommendations for this uh, uh, proposal for the board. Okay, we're ready. Welcome. Thank uh, you. The two of you can take over whenever you're ready. All right, I'm Lyndall King, the chair of the uh, East Cliff Technical Advisory Committee, uh, here with my colleague, Mike Bertelson, vice president. And I, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I have been a member of the ETAC committee since its founding in, I think, the mid-80s, so I have a long history uh, with East Cliff and of all the changes that have gone on there. And I just want you to know that the ETAC committee really takes seriously its role in stewardship of East Cliff for um, the University of Minnesota. As you know from the memo, it includes uh, members from uh, Vice President Bertelson's shop from the Board of Regents and faculty members, including myself. Um, we try to balance the priorities of infrastructure maintenance and safety, creating a gracious and welcoming place for the university to celebrate the accomplishments of its as an institution and of its people, and to provide a comfortable place for people who probably have the most stressful jobs at the university to live in. And so we do balance these priorities. We try to, um, we try to do major projects at a time of transition, which will be coming up in the summer of 2019. Uh, things will be quite disruptive. We do during these times of transition, and that's the reason for the timing of bringing this uh, project to you here today. So um, I'll turn it over to, um, to Vice President Bertelson to talk to you about the details of the project and um, I'll give you a little bit more of the, of the, the nitty gritty. Vice Mr. President. Chair, members, so we, uh, as we maintain a list of facility conditions at East Cliff as we do for every facility in the system and think, um, identify which things make sense in our annual maintenance program and often find their way into our annual capital budget. Um, but as um, Director King said, we do at moments like this during transition, we look for projects that would be very difficult to live through um, and to be in the building while, uh, to have it operating while we're doing. And there are moments for some significant infrastructure and what has risen to the top of that list, there's two priorities, the heating and frankly air, air quality infrastructure replacement and electrical distribution. So you, the heating system is, um, components of it I think are actually precede the 60s. That was the upgrade to the, um, which still has a lot of the original systems even well preceding that. Um, and it's also not just the boilers, but the terminal units, the radiators of the systems, and frankly adding some capacity, some new uh, fan coil units in the, to enable us to better control the environment um, because it right now often gets very hot or very cold. Um, in addition, I'll updating the thermostats from pneumatic to direct, which will give us much more control over the environment and be much more energy efficient, making a, a lower operating cost for the facility. In addition to that, it's upgrading the electrical distribution improvements. The panels themselves and, um, and are in good shape, and we have replaced those as well as the plugs. But this, the wiring between those spaces um, is still original cloth insulated wiring and we really need to uh, <laughs> think that it might be a good idea in a largely a wood facility to upgrade that as quickly as possible. Um, we are um, knew that these would, things would be coming along. Um, the pace and timing of the transition obviously moved uh, a little faster than we had prepared from a planning perspective. So we've identified it has for sort of feasibility, but we do not have a designed 
um, project yet. And so we consider this $970,000 as a do not exceed number for us. We certainly will be driving to see how efficiently we can deliver that. And we have more work to do before we bring this back to you in February for action. And with that, um, I'd say from the funding source as well, just to identify when we do projects of this size and magnitude, um, we always seek to use resources that do, are not state appropriation or tuition. Um, that has come in a different, different, uh, op different sort of funds over time, and this particular time is using university rental income, which again is not neither tuition nor state appropriation for the, for the funding of this project. And with that, um, we are glad to um, answer any questions. Okay, and uh, again, this is just for review today. Uh, mm -hmm. Re Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, fully understand and respect the 970 and the projects that need to be done at East Cliff. My question is this, are there gonna be projects, when you do these projects, provided Florida agrees to it, that there's other projects that uh, have of uh, importance as well for the infrastructure. And what I'm getting at, I don't think we want to spend money uh, that we don't have, but at the same time, it makes good sense if we're, for another million dollars that we could borrow against some account and repay it. If we're gonna be moving furnaces and boilers and electrical things, and you come back in two years and said, said to the board, you know, we should have done that in uh, the spring of 2019, I know what I know what everybody's we're cognizant of the budget and and it's East Cliff mm -hmm. where the president lives. At the same time, it's a it's a very uh, important uh, facility to this university. You know, certainly, President and Mrs. Kaler have entertained literally thousands of people, and uh, so. Are there other projects that you have in your back bag, Mr. Bertelson, that you think <laughs> ought to be taken care of? I, I'm worried about an open-ended question there, but go ahead, Mr. Bertelson. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Johnson, uh, it's a dangerous question to ask the guy who has facility needs behind him, so I can always come up with a list, and that's a challenge I'm always glad to do. Um, but what I'd say is I think these are the two projects that the East Cliff Technical Advisory Committee yes. has prioritized and feel are the most important to do at this time. We, uh, for the, many of you which have a long history about even that led to their origin of this committee, which um, Director King has been a part of from, since the beginning, has been it's important for the university to be prudent about how much it invests at this, in this facility at any given time and we to be uh, systematic and methodical and consistent and that has been our approach to make can, can every year we're making investments but not necessarily try to do everything all at one time and that's been my um i think which has been a successful strategy um since um director king has been engaged in this effort and uh um, that's one as well i would advise as well i think there certainly are always additional things but many of many other things we could do over time and in pieces. These are two projects that are difficult to do at one piece at a time. Um, it's hard to do, um, and we would we recommend the, taking the opportunity because they're very disruptive to the building or have to open up walls and other things would be difficult to live through while we do them. But I think these are the two that sort of meet that criteria for this particular moment. Yes, Mr. Chair, agree. members of the board, this is the time to do it. In the transition period, no doubt about it. Again, I, under, I understand the public relations, I understand the budget, but if there's other things that you think ought to be done, and I had some discussion with Mr. Burnett, I know the windows, there's some window issues. And to replace some of the windows, that's energy efficient issues that will lessen the cost of operation. It's all mm -hmm. those kinds of infrastructure yep. things. I don't want us to be like sometimes a city will dig up a street, put a new sewer line, Four years later, to come back, dig up the street, and put in new electrical cables. You know, right. that, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. you know, talking about, members of the board. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, excuse me, Regent Johnson, I would just say in answer to that that we're absolutely aware of that. And if you would like us to spend more money, we certainly could. But um, windows are something that can be done over time. Um, you can replace, you know, 10 windows this year, 15 windows the next year, whereas this is something that can't be done in that way. So ETAC is trying to be prudent, is trying to protect the university's reputation, 
Um, and in light of the discussion we just heard, we understand that the public doesn't always understand the difference in dollars, even though we do, and we know that that um, tuition is not um, a factor in this. We're trying to protect the university's reputation as well as um, make East Cliff safe for the residents and for uh, the university uh, for people to gather in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm, I'm just going to build right off of what uh, Regent Johnson uh, is, is bringing up. And it's, it's a pleasure to see you, Director King. You've Thank you. uh, done amazing work um, with the museum and with uh, Eastcliff over these years. And, and as, as I think you're also building off, um, Eastcliff was quite famous in the mid 80s. Um, <laughs> yes. As, as it was. And, and that, I think, is that really grants uh, salience to. Um, to Regent Johnson's position, uh, because the, where, where the public seems to, to attach a concern is when there's a resident in the building. When there's a, when someone's living there in, in the, for the long term, mm -hmm. then it's well the president brought forward a proposal to f fix his or her windows or to you know, upgrade this or upgrade. This is really the time where where you're not, especially if you're at a time of tension. You know, over something else that's going on in, in the uh, in the world or at the university at the time. So, I would be very interested. Um, you know, I, I don't think we need to necessarily upset what's before us today. But I would be very interested when you said you've established priorities and these were the first two. I'm interested in three, four, five, because I think if there is an opportunity for us to um, to be able to address these issues, whether it's through a, a reasonable. Um, lend lease opportunity or, or um, of another source of funding, this is absolutely the time because that way you're not saddling the, all that, you know, as you say, public misperception mm -hmm. about the fact that this is absolutely a state asset. Uh, this is not just a residence. This is a very, very important um, resource for the institution uh, and, and for the whole state. So um, to that extent, I, I would be very interested in, in seeing those additional items to see if it's something that we could potentially address prior to a, a new occupant um, taking residence. Thank you. Thank you. We can do Regent Chu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, having lived through the uh, climactic uh, events of the 80s um, with um, East Cliff and the fence and all that stuff, um, I, I'm inclined to um, kind of uh, agree that, you know, we don't want to spend more money than we need to, but we should spend enough money such that you know, we can guarantee that the place is a, a nice place to live and um, use for entertaining purposes, which has been, um, I think, used uh, significantly more than it was uh, ever in the past. So, uh, but I also want to make the point that, you know, $970,000 is $970,000 regardless if it comes from university rental income or tuition because it all is in the same pot. Mm -hmm. um, if we have to, if we have to borrow uh, to do it, that's fine with me. But um, at the same time, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to live in the house with uh, cloth covered wiring. I don't know why the Kalers did. You must not have known. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do support the project. And, you know, if, if there is something significant that, you know, you can do at the same time that you have the place opened up and all that stuff, you know, I think you should bring that to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Hsu. <laughs> President Kaler still shaking his head. Uh, Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I'm totally supportive of this. I'm also interested in what three, four, and five might look like. But I'm just curious, university rental income, can you just tell me what you're renting and what that? Vice President Bertelson. Um, Mr. Reg um, Mr. Chair of Regents, um, it comes from a variety of sources. The, the One of the primary ones is the land lease for the graduate hotel. Um, but it's, we have people lease rooms, spaces, and campus all the time, and it, it uh, goes into a rental account, and um, yeah, so we this is one of those per op options to use it for. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Spigum. Mr. Chairman, just a follow-up clarification, if I could, uh, and I fully agree that the uh, timing is right, the existing need, no questions. Uh, Mr. Burnett, the rental income, that 970000 goes to a rental account. Where, what is that rental account to? 
Senior Vice President Burnett. It's a central account. Regents Figum, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a central account that we collect all the rents and leases off lands, off buildings, centrally, and it's it's available for one-time uses for things like this. It's it's not a recurring piece, so but it's an account that has been in place for quite some time because we do have a lot of real estate and a lot of buildings, and we we occasionally have folks that want to rent. The big one is, as Vice President Bertelson said, is we have a land lease on the Graduate Hotel that provides income on an annual basis. Um, I think that is going to become more of a way we look at things as we talk about our strategic asset review and those types of things. But the primary one that's funded this account is um, the Graduate Hotel's lease payments to the university. So it comes centrally, and it's available for uses like this. But it's not something that is, is a huge consequence that would drive things differently. Mr. Chairman and then Mr. Yeah. Burnett, that uh, land rent down at Newmark Park would be included in that, probably? The, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Re uh, Regents Figum, that's in a separate account. UMOR was always accounted for separately. It's got its own rental income, uh, and it's starting to get the rental income or the from the aggregate, the, the lease on the aggregate. The challenge is we've spent over $5 million on environmental and legal with respect to that, so it's got a negative account that's starting to come back up, getting close to zero. So that has always been account, Rosemont has always been accounted for separately. And actually there's board policy about land sales there, about where those proceeds go into a quasi endowment. Um, and so that would not flow into this account. So you more by board policy has always been, um, and, and was in place well before I got here, that this was going to be a separate accounting and a separate accounting to the board. So you more is not in that. Mr. Chairman, we need to get the project done without question. I just right. want to make sure that this, uh, the comments about uh, the money where it goes, that there wasn't a void being created that had to be filled no. by tuition or state dollars, and that's not the case. It's a separate account that, uh, that would not go to uh, program, uh, no. would not go to reducing tuition or uh, other expenses. So that's fine. No, it, I, I can. We can get the data. The board set this up quite some time ago about where the U more rents and leases come in. But Ryan, I don't. I don't need it. Anymore. Okay. So, in Regents Figum, we just discovered that instead of you complaining for your room rates at the graduate, you are now contributing to the East East Cliff uh, <laughs> <laughs> Restoration Fund. Just look at it that way, and you won't feel so bad. You're paying. Walk many blocks for twenty bucks. Okay. Uh, we still got Regents uh, Region Beeson. I'll pass. Okay. Okay. So I guess is there no one else that would like to like to speak to them? I guess that was for review. So we're going to be uh, approving that. I guess in February also. Is that the expectation, Mr. Thank, Chairman? Thank, thank, yes, Regional Mark. Uh, just for the presenters, or maybe even uh, CFO Burnett, it, seeing that it seems like the board is coming to consensus on this, is there any reason uh, that waiting till February might slow down what could be done sooner? Is there a, a reason to entertain a motion now? Um, or does it make sense to wait? If there's no consequence, then we can leave it as is. Uh, Senior Vice President Burnett. Uh, Regional Mari, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're in, we're in good shape time-wise because we're just starting the design process. Really getting your feedback today is helpful that we're not wasting time doing the design work on what you just saw. I, we do need the answer in February of what we're going to do because um, President Kaler and Mrs. Kaler, it's my understanding, plan to move out in mid-May. And then we would schedule everything for that in that gap period. So having the answer by February would be very helpful to us to make the time as short as possible to get the projects done. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And while we're waiting, uh, we're going to have our next item will be a collective bargaining agreement. We have our friends, Vice President Brown and Senior Director Dion will be coming up and we'll be taking that in just one moment. <laughs> Well, hello. Is uh, Senior Vice President Vice President Brown looks like she's staying in the back today. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are already uh, Senior Director Dion. If you want to uh, tell us about this, and then we'll get a motion on the table and discuss it. Chair Anderson, Senior Vice President Burnett, and members of the committee. I am hoping this is the shortest presentation you will have today. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I am pleased to bring today for your approval the labor agreement that we have negotiated with the health care employee group. This employee group is represented by AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. 
This healthcare unit is composed of 202 employees. These employees work primarily in the School of Dentistry, Boynton Health Services, and COOP, the Community <coughs> University Healthcare Center. This is just a one-year contract, and it covers the time period from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. And the settlement is pretty straightforward. This negotiation uh, focused primarily on wages. Our settlement consists of a 2% salary pool, which is consistent with the salary pools for our other employee groups. And our settlement for this healthcare group is to move the wage scale by 2%. So the union chose to put all of the salary pool towards that wage scale. So each, and each employee in this unit would receive the same percentage increase. So again, no language changes in here. Uh, a one-year contract with a 2% pool. And it's, uh, I think, the most straightforward settlement that we have had this year. We continue to have a good working relationship with this unit. We'll be looking forward to going into negotiations again in the late spring. And with that, we ask for your approval of this labor agreement. Okay, so I'm going to ask for a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with Ask Me Local 3260, the healthcare unit. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I, Mr. Chair, I just uh, recognize that I know there's, there's a lot of work that's done, done for these contracts, and we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Any more discussion? Okay, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor of the recommended approval of the proposed labor agreement with Ask Me Local 3260, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. You were a short presentation. <laughs> uh, we're going to next ask for Vice President of Technology, Bernard Golicek, to come up and talk about strategic priorities. As he is coming up, I'm going to ask Senior Vice President uh, Brian Burnett to introduce the proposal. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Over the past year and working toward a system-wide strategic set of priorities, our finance and operations team has focused on what is needed to support the university's mission. Today, we want to spend a little time focused on the information technologies. IT serves as a critical function that supports the priorities of this institution's teaching, learning, research and discovery mission, as well as outreach. We thought it would be helpful for you to hear about how the university's IT is managed and, is, and, and about some of the larger initiatives that are underway that are essential to supporting mission priorities of this university. I also understand that this may be the first time that the board has been engaged in a high level general strategic discussion related to information technologies. I hope you find this to be useful. Our presenter today, is, as Regent Anderson said, is Vice President for Information Technology and our Chief Information Officer, Bernie Gulichek. During his time in this role, uh, Vice President Gulichek has focused on the organizational design of the IT management function across this institution that delivers improved service, quality, and scalability for efficiencies, while at the same time enables innovation with a structure that promotes agility. So with that, I would like to turn the presentation over, Mr. Chairman, to Vice President Gulich. Vice President. Chair Anderson, members of the Finance and Operations Committee, I'm delighted to be here today to share with you the way in which the information technology management function supports the mission of the University of Minnesota. In the time that we have together this afternoon, I'd like to ground us in facts related to the IT management function and the role that IT serves in supporting the mission. I'd like to provide you with an overview of the IT service portfolio, how, is it, it, how it is informed, and how it adapts to changing conditions. I'd also like to acquaint you with the mechanisms that we use to manage the function to ensure outcomes, and finally, to provide you with a sense of the large IT projects that are underway that are in direct support of the mission. I'd like to begin by grounding us in a few University of Minnesota information technology facts. Services that I reference are used on all campuses, extension offices, and research and outreach centers. These services are used system-wide. The total number of staff members in an information technology classification represents 6% of the university's total staff members. Information technology spending represents roughly 6% of the institution's total annual expenditures. 
There are 22 central services that include over 150 enterprise public-facing technologies that are leveraged and used in all locations throughout the system. And finally, it should look and be glaringly apparent to you that as a system officer, I think system first. Those of you who know me know that I'm extremely focused in supporting the institution's tripart mission. Technologies support, enable, and have the power to advance the goals and objectives of the university. While there's no mention of information technologies in the university's mission statement, you can't show me any part of that mission that isn't enabled by the use of information technologies. Technologists across the institution have grown weary of my mission support message. Uh, it, remains extremely important as they need to be reminded that we do not do technology for technology's sake. We're not a technology enterprise. We are a teaching and learning, research and discovery, and outreach enterprise. And we achieve the mission through the use of information technologies. A thorough and robust IT service, IT service governance system informs the creation, modification, and retirement of IT services. Each student, faculty, and staff member is invited to provide feedback on IT services through an annual electronic survey or focus group session or after each encounter with their use of IT services. Faculty, student, and business stakeholder governance provides important input to service levels and the way in which services are delivered. That input results in an IT service catalog that supports the mission and each component of the mission through the university system. I like to refer to this illustration of information technology services as the university's IT ecosystem. The ecosystem is a catalog of 22 centralized services shown in the center of this illustration, complemented by unique pedagogical discipline or business line specific services. Examples of services unique to discipline include specialized instructional electronic medical record systems in the School of Dentistry, instrumentation and research technologies in science and engineering, and specialized technologies and in instructional clinical labs in our academic health center. Examples of services unique to business or support units include dining, admissions technologies, residence hall technologies, athletic technologies that are specialized to those business needs. The details behind the categories and within the disciplines and the business lines simply shows the extent to which information technologies are needed in each and every part of the university. These services are managed by technologists who are positioned and near the pedagogy or the business, but distant enough to be far away to be efficient. Generally, they report to a dean, chancellor, or a VP. They leverage the center's infrastructure and back office expertise as if it were a holding company that was providing services to its business line subsidiaries. <clears throat> How is this highly yet integrated distributed management function managed to deliver results, avoid duplication, and ensure delivered value? You'll recall that I previously referenced the IT's expenditure as 6% of the institution's total spending. I strongly feel that IT must justify itself by delivering at least 6% of value as measured by student, faculty, and staff productivity, operational efficiency, and creating strategic opportunities that are simply not possible without the use of information technologies. So how do we manage and measure those values? We begin by understanding the operational resource requirements that are needed to support the services in the ecosystem and to understand these resources in detail for each service team. I, it shouldn't surprise you that staff members are comprise the largest percentage of IT expenses at the university. It's a very staff-driven management function, followed by equipment and maintenance, software, and professional services. 
I use this detailed understanding of resources regularly in interactions with IT, with IT leaders of each unit and annually engage chancellors, deans, and my fellow VPs in a qualitative and quantitative conversation focused on IT value. We discuss in detail the intersection of central services with those that are provided locally and the resources that are needed to deliver them. We review unit specific resources and compare them to similar units within the university system. And we determine if and or where quality enhancement, cost containment, or reduction strategies are needed. In summary, we discuss mission specific needs and gaps in services or delivery that are needed to be addressed or where action is needed. I also use this information to measure information technology expenses as a percentage of total university expenditures. As seen in this not perfectly to scale chart, as the entirety of the institution's expenditures have increased, information technology expenses have remained relatively flat. A closer look reveals that while the entirety of the institution's expenses, all of instruction, research, and support, has grown on average 4.1% annually, information technology system-wide as a management function has grown on average 1.6%. And your central IT office of information technology has grown on average 0.1% over that same period. All while incre increasing the portfolio of services provided to the institution, improving the quality and the efficiency of those services, and continually adjusting to changes in the industry. I firmly believe that the slow rate of IT investment as compared to the entirety of the university is largely due to the professionalization of the management function and the IT ecosystem's organizational design, whose structure promotes agility and adaptation to a rapidly changing technology environment. This organizational design concept is also often referred to as the business digital transformation that you might hear about in trade rags and, and, and in the industry. I'd like to pivot for a moment to highlight a few larger IT initiatives currently underway that may catch your attention or that you may hear about in your oversight capacity. These initiatives represent system-wide effort to which information technologists from all system campuses, colleges, and support units participate. You'll recall previous board meeting deliberation and approval for a learning management system transition from Moodle to Canvas as a core tenant to the university's next generation digital learning environment. I'm happy to report that that transition is over 75% complete and that teams are preparing to retire the legacy course management system next fall for instructional use. We're making this transition in the context of Unison, a consortium of eight Big Ten institutions plus three others who are focused on a, building a next generation digital learning environment. This environment includes several ancillary teaching and learning tools managed by the consortium that will also yield data known in the industry as learning analytics. These analytics will help members of the consortium understand the conditions that enable student success in a digital classroom. As part of cyber, several cybersecurity initiatives currently underway, we recently began a two-factor authentication requirement for all students, faculty, and staff in the university system. Those of you in the audit committee may recall previous conversations related to the importance of this initiative. But while this measure will significantly enhance the protection of the university's data, it will also aid the prevention of financial aid, payroll, and identity theft resulting from email phishing attempts. The requirement began on the 1st of November, and the enrollment coincides with the annual password reset requirement. I'm happy to report that over 24,000 users have enrolled in this service, and less than 1% of those users have called the helpline for assistance. Enterprise, uh, I'm sorry. You should also recall previous board meeting deliberation and approval for the university's system-wide 
network upgrade. This upgrade increases the speed by which information travels across the wire by factors of two to 20 times. This, all, this upgrade also includes several cybersecurity components, firewalls, threat monitoring, intrusion detection, and denial of service attack tools. Effort on this project is now mostly focused on the distribution and edge electronics replacement, which began on the St. Paul campus this fall. Users are experiencing, on average, one minute of network disruption in the portion of the building that's being served by the equipment that is currently being replaced. This project will be complete in the spring of 2020. And this board should know that when complete, there will be one team managing the data network for the entire University of Minnesota system. I can't underscore the importance of the centralization of this service as it affords the university's chief information officer and his team direct line of sight to each and every network connection in the university system, which improves the university's cybersecurity risk profile and enables faster detection and or remediation of network-based security incidents. In conclusion, I hope that this information has provided the committee with helpful insight to the way in which information technologies support all of the components of the institution's mission. It's important to understand that IT as a management function cannot be seen solely as a cost center, but rather as a strategic enabler that makes things possible that previously were not. While at the same time recognizing those commodity-like services that should be driven to least cost. My hope is that you will take away from this presentation an understanding that the IT management function is extremely focused on supporting, enabling, and advancing the institution's mission through the use of information technologies, and that we understand that the value of IT, that the value that IT provides is in its ability to increase productivity and efficiency. And with that, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, my remarks are concluded. I'm eager in answer to questions and hear your feedback. Thank you for your engagement today. Thank you. I have not heard anybody ever say they're eager to take questions from this. <laughs> <laughs> so you might be the first. Uh, we're going to start here. Regent, it was a great presentation. Regent Beeson. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Vice President Golubchuk. You may not. I'm going to throw you a curveball. Um, you said we're not a technology organization, and I would submit that we are a technology organization. When Lloyd uh, Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs, defines that company as a technology company, and Exxon and uh, Walmart now consider themselves, I mean, you think about research, knowledge, data, platforms. I. I think that paradigm has shifted, and that's a debate that not everybody might want to accept or understand. But I, who's who's more in the information and uh, uh, business than we are as a major research university? I, I think it's a great debate. So yeah, you're being too modest when you say we're not. You have an answer to that, Vice President. Uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Beeson, I, I think that would be a really interesting debate. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in some of my remarks, I'm very focused on mission. And if that mission is in the teaching and learning, research and discovery and outreach areas, I strongly feel that information technologies play a significant partnership role in the delivery of those services. That said, the institution is in the knowledge generation business and, and that is in the information technology space. So innovation, is aided by the use of information technologies. Great, great debate. Regent Paul. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Anderson, and, and um, um, thank you, um, Vice, Vice President. I appreciate the presentation, especially the, the um, sort of uh, discussion of um, what's centralized and what's decentralized, and you know, with your the focus on delivering as much scale and efficiency as you can, I think that's I think that's um, really strong, and I appreciate the strategic value that, you, that your team brings to the university. So I don't have a question. I it's really more of a suggestion. So 
IT, I think because it tends to be counted and, and, and the, the data on internal IT collected the same way, it, it's, a, it's a really benchmarkable kind of activity across in, institutions. I've been involved in a couple of exercises like that in two completely different industries, and I was pretty amazed by the range, you know, and you kind of highlighted that 6% number, which I think is useful. I was, I was amazed by the range of spending, you know, in similar organizations um, and in, you know, in the same industry. And so I, my suggestion is that we, you know, we try to get comparative benchmark data across Big Ten or, or something, because, I mean, one, it'd be interesting to know where we fall and, and, and how much people spend, but also, I think that kind of exercise can you know, can just challenge how we do things and lead to um, lead to new thinking, you know, on on how to deliver the service. Vice President Belichick, Chair Anderson, Regent Paul, members of the committee, I too agree that the benchmarking exercise is is extremely helpful and informative in the way that we think about where our information technology investments ought to be, and. I can assure you that the team engages in that regularly. What I can also tell you is that it's very difficult to get a comprehensive number for peer institutions. What I can tell you is throughout the, we, we cite uh, information resources that, um, that are in this higher education information technology sort of uh, space, and, and one of them is EDUCAUSE. Um, and the data that you will find in EDUCAUSE is, is, is very helpful to a person in my role, but I can honestly tell you that the only really comparative metrics that I have confidence in are those that are related to the central IT units. And for what it's worth, the latest comparison that I was able to, um, to put my finger on had the lowest, um, the lowest big comparable Big Ten institution and their central IT unit at 3.1% of their institution's total spend. And we're at two. Um, so I'm really proud of that. I mean, the reality though is you, you might start asking yourself at what point you're not investing enough. Mm -hmm. but, the, but, the, but the other things that I don't know is what's in and what's out in that comparison. So the service portfolios are likely very different between central units in the Big Ten. So the, the long answer was that. The short answer is uh, benchmarking is extremely valuable if I can get confident data. Thank you. So, so I'm interested in, in, in this, Vice President Kalarsh. What What does the IT department do really, really well at this university. And if you had unlimited resources, what could you do better? <laughs> Monitor Thank you. your search history. Uh -huh. <laughs> Monitor your search history. Yeah. Yeah. Chair Anderson, um, members of the committee, thank you for that question. I, I think the information technology management function as a whole is extremely responsive to its end users. And um, I think that, that their engagement in problem solving is admirable. The, the ways in which they come at university problems and seek solutions to those problems through the use of information technologies, recognizing that um, that having technologists run the enterprise is probably not a really good idea, but, but partnering with the business owner or, the, or the, the, the pedagogical owner in that particular area, I think our information technologists are really, um, they're really supportive of the mission and they deliver on that mission with, with, a, with a very cost conscious mindset. I, I think the rest of the institution would better be able to answer the question related to what could I do if I had an endless supply of, of resources. There is an insatiable demand for information technologies at this institution. And many times I feel like um, the folks that I interact with would like a technology butler, but the institution simply can't afford that, right? So, um, so 
I believe that technologists are really good about understanding the kinds of services that are provided across the entirety of the portfolio. The, the, the wheel, the, the ecosystem diagram that you saw is intended for technologists to understand who might be working on something that they've been asked to work on, but they know is not in their wheelhouse or is out of alignment with their particular unit or component mission. So they're able to reference and resource colleagues across the institution in a way that, um, in a way that sort of elevates the profession and keeps the, the, the management function itself aligned and, and, and well tuned to the expertises of the people that are delivering those services. Interesting. Interesting. That, that's interesting. You know, I have to chuckle because you say, like, we might want to have a technology butler. I just thought of myself, I've probably got two of those at home, but I've had to pay like 20 years of, of uh, expenses for them to grow up. Uh, <laughs> that's how I get my technology supporter for my children. Uh, any other questions? I have a comment. Uh, Vice President Burnett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that what I've come to appreciate about um, uh, our IT division and their work is thinking about how, how much we need to invest in the right area, meaning we don't have to have, I don't think, in my opinion, the Cadillac of every system to run this place efficiently. I think we, we have the middle of the road or the, the reliable car for the things that are back end of the business. But in some cases, we do need the best supercomputer or the best um, analytical data if we're going to support the world's best researchers. So I think I think what I appreciate is that sometimes it's, it's, it isn't one size fits all. For the business of this organization, we should have a reliable um, set of tools that help us run this business. But when it comes to technology for some of the world's top researchers, I, I think that's where we make decisions with our, and help them make good decisions about bringing the tools to help them succeed at, at their mission. So I, I just think that's what I appreciate is it isn't just, um, we need the best of everything. I think they've got a very good cost conscious feeling about what, where, where does technology add value to this organization and where does it not add value? That's a really good point because when I think of IT, I think of the internet and things like that, but the research that goes on here and how fast they work and what they do, that's a big part of it also, correct? Yep. Okay. Any more questions for Vice President Kalarczyk? Otherwise, we're gonna let him off the witness stand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we are going to move on to the consent report. I'm going to tell you folks that it's, it's a, a large consent report today. In a minute, I'll read through a, a part of it. I want you to know, though, that um, I did about five or six check marks here. I think every one of the bullet points on your deal are multiple year contracts, and, and it's being done to save money across our system. Uh, we didn't used to get those to us because when they were one-year contracts, they didn't reach the threshold. But now when they go three, four, five years or have uh, options to do that, they do reach the threshold. So the revised consent report, which you have a copy of, includes the central reserves, general contingency, purchase of goods and services, one million and over, the third amendment to the employment agreement for the head football coach, Twin Cities Campus, the off-cycle tuition approval, capital budget amendments for three projects, a resolution related to the issuance of debt, a resolution, resolution related to the financing of debt, and a schematic design for one project, which I will tell you the schematic design is only on your uh, computer and not on the uh, hard copy. So uh, we can pull any of these items out and vote on them one at a time. Before we do that, I'll just ask Senior Vice President to uh, uh, Burnett to walk through the report and uh, he can, we can maybe get a motion and then answer any questions. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, as, as Regent Anderson said, uh, we have a number of purchase of goods and services that are multi-year. We have removed one, but quickly, um, FM Global is how we lay um, outside purchased insurance on top of our self-insurance plan. That's a multi-year contract, as you can see. Um, same with the finish line flooring, a five-year contract. Um, specialists that manage with uh, with our laboratory medicine that's a multi-year contract as well um, Wiley and Sons is one of our big uh, um, sources for electronic data for researchers and scholars and students 
and that is also a two-year um, uh, effort. And I, I would note that in the docket material that we do buy through the Big Ten Academic Alliance to try and keep those costs down, but they continue to go up each year. And so uh, credit to Provost Hansen and her colleagues at the Big Ten Academic Alliance to try and get a Big Ten contract with these folk, um, with these companies because they seem to go up every year. Um, we also have Minnesota Elevator for the Duluth campus. Um, we outsource those services, more economic than having our own inside, uh, inside the university. And then um, over at the Kook Clinic, uh, the, the EPIC having the medical record, we are the owners of the Kook Clinic and proud owners of the Kook operation um, in Minneapolis. And just uh, that's a very expensive to hold on to a medical record. In this sense, it's the only one we have because the other medical records in our system are Fairview owned or, uh, and managed. Um, Roach Diagnostics, obviously, we have a lot of chemical analyzers and we need those to make sure that they're maintained well. So as we walk through all of those, um, the last one, we did pull one um, as we were working through this process on a multi-year agreement with one of our vendors. Um, terms and conditions weren't favorable to the university. And I think it's appropriate for us to pull those back and we'll go with a one-year contract that doesn't need board approval and we won't bring it back to you unless we think the economic terms are, 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 are Correctable. So our apologies for some strike type in your agenda, but I think it's the right business decision for the university. And since the time the docket was put together, um, the terms started to change. So we pulled that. And so that's those are all the purchases. Quite, And then we did have to re, um, repair the record, quite frankly, or correction to the October record. We actually um, had a clerical mistake, and it's our apologies that we had a wrong name of a corporation for something that was awarded in October the board had approved. We need to correct that for the record. Um, and then the off-cycle tuition is just something that when summer's coming, we need those, uh, this is very routine for this board to approve those summer rates for things that, are, that they're recruiting students for now. Um, I think I would ask President Kaler if he would like to talk about the employment agreement amendment for the head football coach on the Twin Cities campus. President Kaler, go ahead. Chair Anderson, yes, uh, I have discussed this uh, with you. Um, given uh, Coach Fleck's progress uh, and, uh, and recent acquisition of the acts, as well as uh, significant uh, progress in this program, uh, we are proposing to uh, move his contract forward one year, essentially uh, add a year extension. This is precisely what we did last year at this time, uh, and uh, the schedule of uh, of uh, payouts that if we were to separate from him and what he would owe us if he were to separate from us are included in your docket materials. We ask your approval for that. Thank you, President Kaler. Uh, do you want to continue? Sure. Vice President Burnett. And then on the capital budget amendments, we have three projects uh, for the committee's consideration. Um, these are uh, donor funded projects, a teaching lab on the uh, St. Paul campus. Um, two of them are at the horticultural operations headquarters at the at the Arboretum at one of the really nice assets of the university and its outreach mission and then the Essex quarter reconstruction as we have a lot of work going on in the super block area and Harvard Avenue between the health sciences education center the 111 million in improvements to the UMMC by Fairview um, work going on in the super block um, and with all of that torn up and, and it may Many of the regions may have seen the work we've done at Church Street at the conclusion of the Tate construction. Get those utilities done, get the fire lanes done, and candidly the work in this area is to make the paths for a lot of our physicians, a lot of our patients that walk from the parking area near the CSC to the UMC and back. Also um, enhancing our fire lanes on the interior of the, of the uh, super block, which is over 2,000 students live there each year, um, something that's quite important. And uh, when we looked at this project to bring it as a capital budget amendment, it's also noted that this is a common area for every tour of every prospective student. So while we have it torn up, we think it's a time to make the changes to get both safety from a fire lane perspective. And this is coming out of auxiliary funds, some facility services funds, some one-time funds to get that um, walkway a big east-west walkway improved while we're while we're finishing up construction in that area. So those are the those are those three. The resolution related to debt, as the uh, committee may recall, 
we have we have authority from the board to issue up to four hundred million dollars in commercial paper. We are starting to use those to, for these projects that you've already approved, and now it's time to go take some of that out and do the permanent financing. And so, a piece of this is just replacing the commercial paper with long-term debt. In the spring, we see a spring issuance and also getting the remainder of the capital we need to finish projects like the Health Sciences Education Center, the CAMS building on the Duluth campus. There's several that are listed in your docket. But we would like the board's authority today to go when the market timing is correct. We walked the Debt Management Advisory Committee through this process yesterday. They were very supportive. Um, and secondly, we've got a couple of bonds that are coming up on their 10-year call and that were issued when interest rates were higher back in 2008, 2009 period. And it appears we could save um, in excess of a uh, uh, million to $2 million by refunding these bonds at the same time we issue debt, which makes it more efficient to issue that debt at once. So we've brought these forward today for your approval and then we would work with our advisors to look at the timing and where interest rates are to get the best um, price we possibly can with a very strong credit rating in the market this spring to both issue new debt, pay off some of our commercial paper, and refinance these 10-year bonds that are starting to come out. So with that, if you're comfortable with the capital budget amendment, finally I would just say that we have one schematic design that we'd like to get approved today so we can keep going. The CHS Teaching and Learning Lab on the St. Paul campus, if you were to approve both the capital budget amendment and the schematic designs today, we could have it ready for students next August. So that one would be one we would appreciate quick action on today, and that's why they're in that order that they are in the consent agenda. And I think, Mr. Chairman, that's the consent agenda. You covered agenda. most of it, and like I say, there's a lot in there. So if there's any item somebody would want to single out of there, we can certainly do that. If not, I will entertain a motion to recommend. Oh, Regent Paul. Uh, Chair Anderson, don't want to single one out. Have a quick question on Can, I, can I get the motion on the table first? Absolutely. That's all I was going to do. <coughs> um, Mr. Chair, um, just, just to speak to it just briefly, I, I would pull the, the coach extension out, and then I would move the remaining consent report. Okay, so we're going to be, um, I don't know the proper behavior here for that. Do I need a second to pull that out, or that's going to be pulled out? Okay. So we are going to go with the consent agenda. Uh, right at this point in time, I'd like to take a motion for the consent agenda I, I, I minus moved. the coaching so contract. So moved. It's moved. Seconded. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of doing that? Discuss. Discussion. No, not, okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, point, point of order. If, it's, if there's discussion, then it's not a consent report. I mean, the, okay, the concept so of consent report is there's no, is we just by consent vote. Aye. If there's something you want to discuss, you'd pull that item out. Um, well, they're, they're I'll do it. I'll, I'll ask later. <laughs> yeah. So, <coughs> I guess the motion is to pull the football nope. contract. Oh. Yeah. Approve the consent report. Approve the consent report minus the right. minus the. Okay. So we've got a motion on the table and a second on the table to approve the consent report less the uh, coaching contract. Mr. Chairman, is there discussion on that? Regent Johnson. Uh, in regard to Regent Omari's concern, could he not also at this point say, I would like to remove mm -hmm. item mm -hmm. as like an amendment to the motion? I, I could, but I don't want to remove any item, so I'll just ask later. Okay. Thank you, though. <laughs> yeah. so, so we are approving the consent report less the um, coaching contract. And I guess there's no discussion on that if we're going to do it. Okay. Probably. So all those in favor of approving the consent report, less the coaching contract, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Regent Powell, you now have a question. I, had a, I, I can come back to it later. It's, it's a okay. question one of the items that can work. Uh, okay. So now we are, we, the only thing we haven't approved is the coaching contract, correct? So I, do I need a motion on yeah, the table to approve? Mr. Chair, I would move to approve the coaching contract. Yeah, it's been moved to approve, moved and seconded to approve the coaching contract. Now, can we have discussion on the coaching contract? Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and Regent Omari, I, I apologize. I, I'm just trying to work into this consent process, which I think can move things along uh, real quickly. But I just, uh, just a, a, a matter of note, I question for, for uh, President Keeler. Um, in, in, I don't, Director Coyle's not here, and if we need to come back with information later. 
What's the average? How, how does it typically work with these with these major contracts, sort of across our peers? Um, because I, I understand the concept of the extension and, and sort of the recruitment component to it and all that, but to some extent, it doesn't feel like a five-year contract. It feels like a series of one-year contracts with four-year tails. How? At what point in time would we ever just sort of proceed through the contract, um, or or should we just sort of assume that on a, an annual basis we're going to have one-year determinations with with tails on them? President Kaler. Uh, thank you, uh, Region Anderson, Region Rosha. Uh, this is becoming a pretty common way of doing business, and at least in the Power Five conferences, uh, it's a five-year contract uh, that we we do an annual look in. The idea to advance it to continue to have a five-year window, which is, enables the coach to uh, have a good presence when uh, when recruiting. Uh, we've gotten in a habit here of doing these annually. Uh, we could obviously extend for two years. Uh, what we're doing here is moving forward a contract with existing terms. So he's not getting any additional money next year that isn't already called for in his, in his contract. It does increase uh, our buyout uh, liability by, uh, by the one-year increment, which is $3.5 million. It also increases his payout to us if he leaves by a $1 million. Uh, the alternative is to uh, either do nothing, which in this uh, sports age, actually sends a negative message. Um, or to, in fact, start over with a, a radically different contract. And if a coach has a, a trajectory of success, um, that would dictate revisiting the overall basis of his contract. Uh, this contract puts uh, Coach Fleck at uh, the 11th uh, highest paid football coach out of the 14 in the Big Ten. So below average. And again, if he produces the kind of competitive results that we expect to see. I would imagine that uh, my successor and the <coughs> boards will have to revisit that in a, in a, in a way that resets his base. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, President Kaler. I, you know, I'm, I'm supportive. I, um, you know, and certainly continuity is important, I think, uh, for our particular program, and I'm interested in that. Uh, we, there, this, there are Current, you know, there was a current report in the paper about some issues. I haven't seen anything that, that give me pause with respect to the coach, but I would just hope that you would keep us informed as, as these matters develop, and, uh, um, and I, wish, uh, I wish this program great success going forward. Thank you. Uh, Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the board, I'm going to sound a little bit like a uh, curmudgeon in my comments, and I did visit briefly with President Kaler. Um, I do have concerns about this from the standpoint, number one, this is the largest expenditure of dollars in one single person at the university. I believe I'm correct to that. But what bothers me about this, and the public understands, is this is the time of the year that agents start weighing in. They start shopping their clients around. And at some point in time, we're going to have to say, wait a minute, I know that our athletic budget is stressed, and uh, I have, as you know and appreciate, I've been very supportive of athletics and uh, across the wide spectrum, but I'm just not sure we have to go the fifth year. Uh, Coach Fleck is out recruiting now, and he could say to prospective uh, players, uh, I am under contract for the next four years, uh, other than red shirt. That individual could say, yes, I'd like to, you know, play, uh, play for you. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I will tell you I'm struggling with it. I know the board is probably going to pass it and we'll move on, but I think those concerns are warranted and we ought to uh, think about it from the standpoint of just overall expenditures. Again, it's not state funds. It's not tuition. Get that. But what bothers me is this agent starting to circle the wagons and uh, bring these coaches' contracts to all the universities, say, you know what, University of Minnesota, you, you better extend this for another year because, you know, I have some other ideas for Coach Fleck. I don't have any idea what that may be. Now, you certainly can feel free to disagree with me and say, uh, uh, Dean, um, you're not fully understanding all this. I get it, but I probably, at this point in the committee, am going to vote against it unless you convince me between now and tomorrow the board meeting 
And please don't spoil my holiday party tonight by all of you coming and talking to me about this. Just one at a time, please. We're just, we're just going to send Coach to talk to you. But anyway, I just wanted to put it on the table for, for, your, for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Johnson. Is there any other discussion on, on this subject? Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I, I don't know if uh, there was a, a bonus for getting the axe back this year, but there probably should have been. Um, that, that is a reward for performance uh, that I think, um, you know, the, the team as well as Coach Fleck did salvage a, a season where nobody thought uh, we would make it to a bowl game, you know, and, uh, and, and win a trophy game. And uh, so I think you know, there, are some, there are some things in the news right now. We don't know what they are, but I, I do believe that uh, Coach Fleck has earned an extension for this year, and uh, I'll talk to you about it later. <laughs> Any have more discussion? So we've got a motion to second on the table, and we've had discussion about a one-year extension to the football contract. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carries. I think that takes it for the consent report. Just, Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question about the way that we received the consent report? You sure can, sir. Is that is that in? Thank you. Uh, so to, to Senior Vice President uh, Burnett, I am wondering if when we have items that have been competitively bid on, can we add two small pieces of information? One, if it's the same vendor that provided what we need previously, so a continuing contract and they rebid. And then secondly, how many vendors bid on the contract when we hear it's been competitively bid? Is that Mr. Fair game for the future, or do you want to answer the question? Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Regional Mari, we're happy to add those to the future um, request for expenditures over a million dollars. That's Thank not you. a problem at all. Thank you. Regent Chu, you had a question? Thank you, Chair Anderson. I would agree with that. Um, it would be helpful to know that. In addition, there were a couple of um, items there where uh, it said that they, um, they were competitively bid out, but you know, one of them was Wiley and Sons, and I'm just wondering, you know, did we have a bunch of different vendors coming to us to, to give us uh, Wiley and Sons uh, products, or um, was it, I mean, I don't think we could buy Wiley and Sons products from somebody else, so I don't understand how it could have been competitive. I don't know, you have an answer to that, Mr. Chairman? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Regent Shu, you're right. There, there are, I mean, Wiley has this set of social sciences papers and that type of thing, so we try and drive the best bargain we can when they have a monopoly on those authors and those subject matters. And again, that's why I brought up that the Big Ten Academic Alliance, we were partnering with our sister schools to get a better price with them. And I, it's my understanding, it's actually in today's Chronicle, the University of California is working on another provider. They are trying to do similar things what we are, and I think that's in concert with the Big Ten Academic Alliance. So we're doing what we can to keep those cost increases from going up, but that's not one that you're going to be able to competitively bid. It's just trying to keep them from going up. Regent Shu. I, I, I just, the reason I asked the question is because I think it did say it was competitively bid, but maybe I'm wrong. And then while you're looking that up, President Kaler has a question. Uh, just thank you, Chair Anderson. Just as, if we have a minute, just a little level set. I completely support the idea that we provide that information to you. Uh, but please don't expect that you're going to get a lot of situations in which we have uh, a lot of bidders. Some of these are for highly specialized scientific instruments, which are made by at most two companies in the world. One of them may, may not represent in the middle of North America. Uh, there are the branded issues of the Wiley journals, the Elsevier journals that are sold by Wiley and Elsevier, and that's it. Uh, you know, for an elevator service contract, yeah, we should get three bids and pick the low one. So just yeah, level so that, a little bit. So the that. answer to the Wiley and Sons, they maybe have a competitor, but it's not Wiley. Right. The, the, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the challenge is if you want a particular nameplate of a journal because you've had it for 75 years, it's owned by Wiley. You got to buy it from Wiley. There's no alternative. Okay. Appreciate it. Did you? Yeah. Thank you, Chair Anderson. So, yeah, the reason I asked the question is because under Wiley and Sons, it says supplier was selected through a competitive process. Now, if 
if it was just that we bought it from someone who um, could offer a better price, that's one thing, but I, I was confused by that. Also for the EPIC uh, system, the uh, health record system, it also says supplier was selected through a competitive process. So I don't know if we bought it through a reseller and therefore we considered it uh, competitive, but it's still the EPIC system, which is what we had in place. Get those answers. Okay, so let's say you'll get the answers. I want to, EPIC. Jim Paul, does your question come up now? Thank, well, thank you very much. Since we've jumped back into the consent report, <laughs> I'm going to. Oh, we're, we're on. My, my, my question actually also relates to the, the, the Epic system, which which is I, it read read as if we had you know we negotiated that for the Cook Clinic. So so my question has to do with you know we're so good at negotiating multi-year you know very um, system-wide contracts, which I think drives down cost. You know, if you think about university. Uh, the academic medical complex largely, I mean, we've got lots of hospitals and clinics and, and an important alliance. Are we able to leverage um, all of that scale when we negotiate a, a one-off clinic deal like this with Epic? Or, or because of legal entities, is it, is it one at a time? Mr. Chairman, uh, Regent Powell, we'll get you the answer to that. Uh, as I said, uh, m many of our clinics are managed by Fairview, which has their own contracts. With I know. Epic. So I, I don't know the answer to your question, but we'll get you an answer. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Powell. Um, Mr. Langworthy, as you're taking notes, just put all that under uh, information items. <laughs> uh, and which brings me to the point, we do have a a bunch of information items that if you've read them, they're, they're really interesting. I mean, there's everything from quarterly asset manager report to investment report to debt management report. Uh, is there anything you would like to say, Senior Vice President Burnett, that they should see in that uh, information items? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that they're self-explanatory. In years past, we've done some of these as presentations. Just today's agenda was so lengthy that we had to move them to the information section. But if any member of the board would like additional information or clarification about any of these, we're happy to provide. Any other uh, business for the good of the board? Uh, Regent Omari. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I just want to point out the targeted business uh, report that used to be a presentation item in this committee, but there's detailed uh, information in there about how we're uh, following our, our uh, governmental mandate around spending for targeted business, women and minority-owned businesses, uh, and some of the trends in there, I think, will be interesting as we think about economic development, the bidding process that uh, I just brought up, and how we're trying to bring in um, folks who are uh, traditionally not represented in our uh, workforce here at the university. Um, that should be of interest to us all. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? <clears throat> Can I get a motion for adjournment? Second. Adjourn. We forgot to take